Hello listeners, Yamina here. Welcome to the Dr. GPCR podcast. Before we dive into this episode, I wanted to let you know that we are working on a new program geared towards transitioning from academia to industry. Powered by Dr. GPCR, our new program is called the Life Career Job. The goal is to support you in your efforts to find your next job in industry, plan out your career trajectory, create a life and support the lifestyle that works for you. If you'd like to be notified when this program becomes available, fill out our short survey on drgpcr.com career. We are also launching our GPCR consulting services. Soon you'll be able to find the profiles of our carefully selected consultants on our website at drgpcr.com consulting. You'll be able to find the help you need for your company. Stay tuned. The second edition of the Dr. GPCR Summit will be held between September 13th and 19th, 2021. We're planning a combination of live talks, pre-recorded talks, and live workshops. Visit drgpcr.com summit for more information. Are you subscribed to our YouTube channel? If not, please subscribe today. It's not only a great way to catch up on our recorded events, such as the Dr. GPCR Virtual Cafe, but it's also a great way to support us here at Dr. GPCR. All right, let's dive into our episode now. Hello, everyone. This is Yamina from Dr. GPCR. I have the great pleasure of having with me Dr. Stuart Mosley. Uh, I'm so excited, Stuart, that you're here. Um, how are you, Stuart? I'm fine. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm really glad to be here. Uh, as we said, it's a Friday, and Friday is a good time to talk, and uh, so this should be nice and free and easy, and it's a, a real pleasure to, to have your company here. Thank you. Thank you. Same here. And as you mentioned, it is Friday. It is five o'clock somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Not where each of us are, but uh, let's it's somewhere go. in between. There's, there's, you know, somewhere in the Atlantic, it's five o'clock. So if you want a boat in the Atlantic, then take a drink for us. Absolutely. And we're going to stick to our coffees at this point. Absolutely. Yeah. So, Stuart, tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay. Well, uh, I am, uh, you know, first of all, uh, husband and dad and a scientist and uh, a, a researcher. And, you know, for obvious reasons, my research here is focused on GPCRs. But uh, so to go back all the way back into the mist of time, I was born a long time ago now, not in a galaxy far, far away, but in <laughs> Wales. And uh, so I eventually moved to England and then my academic career. So I would say I do talks in local schools and stuff. And I always use two pictures to describe why and where I ended up where I was. The first movie I ever saw was Star Wars. And it's a pretty good first movie to go and see when you're six years old. And that just blew me away. It was just life changing. The next thing which really, so this was science fiction. Then the next sort of experience and movie that I had, a lot of my influences come from cinema or art or music. I think it's really good to sort of get a fire up your brain with those and then apply your brain to other things as you're going along. The next big thing that was a big impact for me was a BBC Horizon film called Life Story. And this was all about the discovery of DNA. And it wasn't a boring documentary. It was a, a novelization of a book written by Jim Watson, all about the experiences of Watson and Crick, Franklin and Wilkins and all the other competitors. And it was a a humanistic story. There was very little technical science in there. It was showing that there was excitement and there was challenge and there was speed and competition and a search for something important. And it was just really fascinating to see. I didn't really know who these people were that much. I mean, I knew their names, Watson and Crick and stuff and DNA, but to see them as humans, to see them as people and to see science as a fun intellectual thing that you would talk to your friends about in the pub after you work and doing research. And it's a, a normal thing which we should be conversant with. And that's a, actually what I'm a big proponent of is, you know, sort of, you know, you can go to see the opera, you can go and see ballet you can go to the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the gallery, but we don't often talk about science appreciation or the appreciation of a great experiment or the appreciation of a great discovery. We're getting there. We're getting there, but often, you know, if you don't appreciate, you know, high art, you're seen as a philistine. Whereas if you don't appreciate science, it's not the same. And I think science is just as important because it's just another human activity. 
and it is an artistic activity. So, it you know, is. I had those sort of two experiences, science fiction and then science fact, and both were formative. And so eventually, after going to school, going to do my A-levels in England, then going to university, so uh, I chose pharmacology because it seemed to me, I was interested in biology and chemistry at school, and pharmacology seemed to be a great combination of uh, biology and chemistry. So I went to the University of Leeds in the UK, and I enjoyed my pharmacology degree there. I did quite well. I was okay. And I'm, I'm an exam person, so it's, it's not ideal. It's, it's difficult. But uh, I was lucky enough to be uh, given a scholarship to do my PhD there. So I did it's an interesting PhD. Uh, I started off doing electrophysiology, so I was patch clamping. But I was looking at a system, which was back then called the neurokinin system, that was imp implicated in the, the pain pathways. So I was working on neurokinin 1 and neurokinin 2 receptors, and then I morphed. So I spent like two years looking down a microscope in the dark doing electrophysiology. <laughs> and I thought, oh, dude, can I do something else? So I also worked, so my two supervisors were Paul Gent and Dan Donnelly. And so we ended up doing a lot of molecular biology on the structure activity relationships of the human NK2 receptor. And that's sort of when I was writing up my PhD and I was learning about the activity structure of receptors, I started reading papers by people called Kanakin and Lefkowitz and Paul Leff. Uh, uh, and I sort of absolutely fell in love with receptor dynamics. The sort of the theory of receptors, I absolutely loved it. And it's sort of in a way, it's sort of like an odd sort of approach to looking at receptors. It was still, I mean, these are the days of the early agonist trafficking with Terry Kanakin and ternary complex theory. I loved it. I absolutely loved it. A lot of people sort of, a lot of biologists see these things. And I often, when I do talks, it's like, oh, a bit of maths now for you. <laughs> it's like you, you went into biology to avoid the maths and the physics. Yep. So I did electrophysiology, which is hardcore physics, and then I did receptor theory, which is a bit more, you know, mathematical modeling. But I loved it. I absolutely loved it. So during the PhD, uh, I sort of started to write off to a whole bunch of people. I wrote off to Stuart Silfon in New York. I wrote to Bob Miller. Uh, and I wrote to Bob, um, the great Bob Lefkowitz, who of you course. have uh, re recently podcasted. And eventually, I was lucky enough to, to interview uh, with Bob, and I told all the other guys, oh, I've, I've been offered a place in Bob's lab. I said, dude, you've got to go. And it's like, but, <laughs> and that was it. It's like, yeah, you've got to go. Okay. So I went and that was my first, that was my interview with Bob it was my first time in America. And it was sort of, it was a fascinating experience. It was sort of like, it looked like England, but it wasn't. <laughs> it was sort of, it's like, oh, this is America then. And it was just fascinating absolutely fascinating so it was uh it was incredibly nerve-wracking sort of meeting the person behind all of the formative papers i mean to a huge degree uh and it's just uh even to this day you have to have a little bit of reverence talking to bob uh yeah. because just of i mean you know i often use the phrase you so you shall know me by the dint of my work you know and you know when you have the work that's there it's like okay that's reputation. That's everything, okay? You don't really need to say anything anymore. <laughs> it's yes. like, that's everything. So in Bob's lab, it was a different world. And so here's, here's my sort of, my initial take on it. And the story I, I always tell people in the lab is that I went there and I thought, well, no one's doing anything. Everyone's standing in the corridors talking. Everyone's just talking in the corridors. No one's in the lab working. What's going on? And I realized, oh, yeah, a talking beats working hard every day of the week because you thrash out and you get the ideas and you write them on a board and things spark into your brain when you're going back and forth and discussing. And the beautiful thing there was you're discussing things with the smartest people you could find who were super hardworking and super driven. And everyone you talk to is just like that. And it's like... It's a critical mass of like really hardworking, talented people. So all of the planning and the brain work then instantly transfers into the research. And it's sort of, that was just transformative to me. And that's why I talk a lot because I realize, and I, I, whenever I go and talk to a student or one comes to my office, there's always bits of paper and it's instantly pen, drawing, and we're talking and discussing and that's it. 
And it's what I used to do in my PhD, stand in the door, talk and discuss, talk and discuss, talk and discuss. I would say a lot of the prep work and the thinking beats a lot of elbow grease in the lab. I mean, if, eventually you have to do the, the hard yards of actually doing the Western blots and doing the boring stuff. Uh, but that's often at the end of a, a very long uh, discussive period. And I really enjoy that now because every single time I do it, I come up with something new or my student comes up with something new. And it's so, and this is why I love doing this thing now and I love doing presentations is because the talking between scientists is the most important thing. I think it's absolutely imperative and good communication is, is, is priceless. So I always... As you can see, I'm talking too much and talking <laughs> over. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just I'm just waiting for that moment where I can take you back a little bit to Star Wars because I have a, I have a two, two couple of oh. questions. Oh, dude, I, I could I'm, be here all all year <laughs> on Star Wars. So here's here's my question. You you mentioned Star Wars, and uh, I was a little bit. Um, I mean, Star Wars has had come out a little bit a uh, long uh, a while by the time I actually was born and I saw the movies, and those are one of my favorite movies. But how come biology or, or pharmacology and not astrophysics? Oh, well, truth was, uh, I was. It's I've had many decisions in my life, and I would say. I was super, super, super into particle physics and astrophysics when I was a kiddie. I was just slightly better at biology. <laughs> <laughs> But in a way, in a way, I'm sort of merging it a little bit now in the fact that almost all I do, I, I do a lot of computational work. I do a lot of physics work with our, you know, we do a lot of mass spectrometry of lots of different types. So a lot of the time I am dealing with a physical situation. And when I give talks in schools, uh, if I want to show them a video of mass spectrometers, I actually use ones from NASA because they do really good videos and they're really beautiful. And it's like, it's much more punchy to see, you know, a mass spectrometer on a spacecraft on a different planetoid compared to just one in a lab doing stuff. So yeah, it's, it's, it was sort of like a pragmatic choice. Physics, you know, it's cool, but then it sort of gets really mathematical. And it's one of those things that it's like with mathematics. I, I'm, I'm quite good at it, but I never really enjoyed it at school because it's, it's taught in a very abstract way. And it's sort it of is. maths is such, I mean, it's a tool. It's a tool. It's not a thing. It's a tool. And it's, it's used in, it's like I do a lot of informatics now. It's a tool. And I make art with it. I take bits of data, which are boring, and I can turn them into something. And it doesn't matter how boring the start material is, you can always make something beautiful out of it. And I think it's, it's, it's one thing for scientists I really do you know, suggest and promote is don't cut yourself off from different branches. I mean, just today, I was just having a discussion with an old friend of mine from NIH, and we ended up talking about crazy biophysical entities. What was it? Uh, liquid phase condensates. Fantastic. Okay. And we came up with some wonderful theories of how life itself might have started from these things. So it's sort of, it's really wonderful. And it, I, you know, you can never close off your mind to input and understanding a little bit. I mean, I still, I would say, on our Facebook page, I post half my things from NASA or from JPL. It's sort of because, or even from things like DARPA and stuff, because these people push the envelope. I mean, this is what's really inspiring about science. And in biology, we push the envelope as well. It's just actually a little harder to get across, especially, so a couple of years ago, uh, we've been doing these things called Pint of Science, where we go and talk about science in local mm -hmm. bars. And so I spent like an entire introduction explaining how small a GPCR really is. And yet it's the most important thing on the planet. And, of course it is. and so I would zoom in from outer space into the bar where we are and say, look how tiny, look, look at the, the scales of magnitude which have to go down. And yet this little heptahelical thing is the basis of virtually half of the drugs that we've ever made. And if we know more about it and exploit more of them, we could easily create therapeutics for many of the really burdensome diseases in the world. Yep. And it's sort of, it, it's, I often describe it as like trying to sort of imagine the invisible because it is too small to see. I mean, you can see crystal structures and cryo structures, but to person in the street, it's, it's, 
impossible to imagine. Whereas put a spaceship on Mars and it's fine. You can, you know, you yeah. can understand it. You can, and I you think can imagine it for sure. That's one thing biologists, yeah. That's one thing biologists have to sort of work a little bit better on in a way is to break through the barrier of the need to understand. I think it's actually gotten quite good now. I think a lot of people understand cells and receptors and targets and stuff. So, but the beauty of it and the sort of temporal nature of biology, I think is a really cool thing. Uh, and it's sort of, that's what I've, I've grown to love in recent years is complexity. And from, for many reasons, complexity of molecular signaling across aging, but just also the molecular complexity that, that takes place on a millisecond to millisecond basis in cells. And we just don't know what that entails and how much, even within a single cell, and we're made out of trillions of cells and all this coordinate and work beautifully every day. Yep. It is, it is a daily miracle. It really is. And, um, it is. and the reason that it works is GPCRs. And that's, uh, I, it, it's really, that's the communicator. That really is. It's how everything. So when I talk about them, I always say, you know, everything from a photon to uh, black widow spider venom. That's my favorite. So we're talking about favorite receptors. Like everyone's <laughs> got to love the latrophilin receptor. It's so cool. When I was a student, it was just called BWSV, black widow spider venom. We had no idea what it was. And being an electrophysiologist, you end you. You have a freezer full of animal toxins, and it's always fascinating. To, I had ones from bees and wasps and scorpions, and snakes, and fascinating things to work on. But the black widow, the alpha latrotoxin, remarkable receptor. I mean, really fascinating. I mean, you know, the spider makes an iron channel and injects it into you. It's crazy. <laughs> it's, it's the most remarkable thing. Uh, I'm always uh, amazed at the diversity and the variability of GPCRs. It's, uh, I mean, there is nothing like them and they're so practical that's what i that's i think that's the great thing about gbcrs and I, I i tell all of my students is that you will never regret you'll you could regret working for me but you'll never regret <laughs> working for gbcrs well mainly because i talk way too much and i you know a normal interview with me might take two days and <laughs> might take four or five hours before i let you go but i always tell them it's like i'm giving you the dog and pony show right because if you can tolerate this and you don't mind it, then you'll be okay, because this will be a daily occurrence. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, sh you should be. You should be. You should give them. You know what they're gonna buy into for the next five, six, seven years, depending on how absolutely. long they'll be staying. So you mentioned that. So Star Wars is not an astrophysicist. You like math, <laughs> um, but but then then how biology and and chemistry? But then how come pharmacology? Well, or was it electric? Okay. Actually, I think it was, uh, it's an interesting thing because, you know, actually you mentioning the word lecture, I used, I was such a nerd. Oh my God. Well, I still am a nerd. Uh, me and I, my friend. I think we all my, are. Anyone listening <laughs> to this podcast and it's, and it's not a bad thing. No, uh, it's, it's, it, it's morphed into a badge of pride now Is that it? you are not afraid uh, to say, oh, I like this and I like that and I like doing this. But me and my best friend from high school, when we were like, oh, I don't know, 14, 15, we used to go to our local university and listen to astrophysics lectures and astronomy lectures by the Astronomer Royal. And I remember to this day, my friend, he actually sent me uh, a posting uh, from a local newspaper when we were kids at school. And I'd, and I'd forgotten we'd had this picture taken from the local magazine and stuff and we were doing uh, radiological testing around our school uh, for the National Radiological Protection Board and so here's me and my friend Griff and Paul and we're like 12 and we're doing radiation exposure experiments and it's like it's so me and Griff used to go to these lectures and one of them was about the Cassini probe and this was 20 years before that was even taken off and saying oh in the future we'll go to Saturn and we'll look at Saturn's moons blah 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 and amazingly enough, about 20 years later, I end up going around to a friend of ours house from NIH, Olga, and her husband, Ron, and Ron works for NASA. Just down the road in Baltimore, what does Ron work on? Oh, yeah, 
and the funny thing with, with Ron is, it's, oh, uh, don't talk to me about work. I just work on the Huygens probe. And like, oh, no, I'd rather not talk about it. It's like, dude, <laughs> you're kidding me. You <laughs> dropped the Huygens probe on Titan and you're not going to talk about it. It's amazing how people become blasé with the most amazing things. But just going from that little, you know, being a young kid, reading about something and seeing something in the future and then being there and experiencing it, it's sort of, it's really fascinating. But to sort of get back to sort of, biology actually i really see i didn't know i had it but i do understand it now and it's one of those things as you get older you start to rationalize and understand why you do what you do and i think the thing is and i'm really moving that way now is the application i think i've always been an incredibly practical person i've never been a good theoretician if i can't feel it touch it build it and break it that's why I wasn't probably that best at, you know, mathematics or pure mathematics when I was a kid, because it's sort of on paper and in your brain, whereas physical stuff, much better. And biology is a lot more physical. So I think pharmacology was uh, it's a sort of truly applicable and translatable form of biological chemical science. And there was a point to it. And I think that's what really... And I think it's, and you know, like I tell my students, I think it's the most wonderful uh, process and job to go into. And especially if you hit GPCRs, because I tell my students that, that you will never run out of things to do with GPCRs. You'll never be in a, a situation where you can't fit in or you can't add to a program or you can't find a position in industry. I mean, even though perhaps they're not the flavor of the month, because, you know, people think it's been done to death. And I remember we always used to say in Bob's lab, oh, we know everything about GBC, everything. It's like, no, no, no. Every single year, every single year, we realize there are a hundred more onion layers to go. And yeah. it's sort of, it's never going to stop. It's never going to stop. We are, I mean, they are the first nano machine. They really are. And I remember when I was working, so after Bob's lab, I went to the MRC and worked with Bob Miller. Another Bob. Everyone I work with is called Bob. <laughs> uh, uh, Bob Miller's a great guy. He's, he, he's hilarious. He's such a, a, a real character. And he's been working for many years on GNRH, so the gonadotropin releasing hormone it's receptor, common. which is fascinating. So beta 2 is the prototype, is the business, and we all know beta 2 And I probably, you know, if you catch me, I can probably recite all the amino acids in, in sequence in order, potentially. Uh, but then GNRH is like the other end of the spectrum. It's sort of quite funky, it's quite esoteric, and it, it's expressed like hell. It is terrible to work on. <laughs> it's really hard because it's really unstable. It has no C term, and it's sort of, it's a real funky receptor to work on. Now it seems, I mean, we know so many more orphans and so many more receptor types. It seems sort of run of the mill, but back then it was really interesting. And I think it was interesting from a zoological point of view, because actually quite a lot of people in reproductive biology are, are interested in zoology. Uh, and uh, from its evolutionary standpoint, you can see the structure and the activation status of GNRH flips and changes with it, every different type of new reproductive strategy that's taken place. And so it's really interesting to see how the molecular evolution has driven and facilitated different forms of life. And so it's really, I love that in a way that you can trace the organismal history and human history and reproductive history through receptors. And it's sort of, it's sort of our, it's, it's gone hand in hand. And I even wrote a piece many years ago, actually proposing that bacteria rhodopsin and rhodopsin were really the driving force for evolutionary life of organisms. And it's sort of, it's sort of a bit of a, I like making sort of bold statements and stuff, because if you're wrong, you're wrong. It's fine. At least it's interesting. I like to have discussion and be, provocative how was um, it received like a lot of my things <laughs> ignored <laughs> i it's i i often i it's one of those things i am not i really don't court uh publicity or bandwagons at all i am a it's a bit of a curse in a way i i i write and i work on what i think is interesting and i think in that way I'm, if I'm appreciated, it'll be post-mortem, definitely. <laughs> but it's, uh, I, I think it's just me. And I like it in a way. Uh, when you're younger, you're more concerned about fitting in and being popular and people recognizing and blah, blah, blah. 
and actually this is one of you know the the sort of talking points I had from Bob Miller was actually he told me oh Stuart don't worry about it I stopped reading papers many years ago I just do what I want to do and that's it it's <laughs> like it was really good advice because I I was like a lot of students and a lot of young postdocs I'm sure you did this as well, is that you do the Saturday morning, oh, I'll just check some keywords on PubMed and see what, oh, no, they've scooped me. Oh, this has happened. And it's like, oh, it, Interestingly, it. I've never done that. <laughs> really? I've, oh. I've never done that. <laughs> I, 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 and I have to admit, I think I always, for a long time, I, and yes, you're right. You grow out of it. You grow out of this need to to fit in and this need. At some point, you have to, you grow into your your personality and you have your own brain and you follow what, what you're interested in. I've always read or went through papers based on what interest what interested me. Yeah. And sometimes people will talk about, oh, did you read that paper and that, the other paper? And I, I would say, no, not because I just, I just, my brain is focused on what I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. Now, did that amount to anything fantastic? I don't know yet. I don't <laughs> think so, scientifically speaking. But I think my interests was always were always different from 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 the mainstream. I yep. got interest. I so I was having a conversation, interestingly, with with Tom Sackmar about we were talking about chemokine receptors, and he he asked me a question. I said, "Well, that's an interesting question." So I actually ended up working on on trying to answer that question uh -huh. because I thought it was interesting. Mm -hmm. And it was Absolutely. about alternative splice variants of, of the chemokine receptor. And to this day, there aren't many papers who actually went deep into trying to understand the signaling properties of these receptors. And it gets mm -hmm. complicated. And unfortunately, I never got a chance to go too deep into, into either this family or any other splice variants where I want to mm -hmm. know, I wanted to know, I still want to know, why does this happen? Why would a cell decide to make three or four variations of the same GPCR. Mm -hmm. And when would the cell want to do that? Yeah, that's, that's it, a really interesting. And in what and context? How dynamic is that exactly? The exactly. Context. And this, yeah, so I've never, no. Usually my weekends were weekends. I used to work very long hours, Monday to Friday, but Saturday and Sunday, I was not, a, I was not near the lab, uh, oh. rarely. Unless there was, I think there was maybe a couple of times when we had to, very quickly provide a rebuttal to some reviewers when right. I would spend 16 or 18 hours running plate after plate after plate to and for, for the whole thing to end up in a small table <laughs> <laughs> and to be oh, yeah. rose. But, but other than that, I always felt like I, I needed, I needed to go about after what interested me. Yeah. I think that's, I think it's sort of, uh, it's a bit of a shame. I mean, a lot of, if you go back and look in the history of science, People used to work on what they were interested in. And there were some, you no, know, there were funny people on boats that were interested in birds' beaks and were interested in making electrical batteries. And it wasn't for any money, it wasn't for any reason. They just really enjoyed it. And they were eccentric and they were esoteric. Uh, but the findings were monumental. I think yeah. the process and the sort of industrialization of science has sort of quashed that a little bit. But I'll tell you a, a quick. Uh, that, the whole talking about the story and stuff of uh, Saturday mornings and stuff. That was, mm -hmm. that, was, that was a Bobby Joe story. So Bob would always, uh, on Friday, say, have a good weekend and I'll see you tomorrow on Friday. <laughs> 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 he knew we were coming in. So, um, so that was my sort of uh, experience of America. You know, first off was coming into the lab on a Saturday. And normally we'd get a, nine holes of golfing. Because if you live in North Carolina, you, you've got to play golf. And I was a pretty good golfer anyway. Well, I wasn't too good. But there's a whole bunch of us that used to play uh, on Saturday morning and then we'd go into the lab after that. But uh, And then I got into car talk in a big way. So that's all I listened to on a Saturday morning was car talk in the lab doing Western blocks with Lou. And uh, so it's sort of... But yeah, I stopped worrying about the competition and uh, sort of... I do work on what I'm interested in. And it's sort of... Uh, I think I was one of the first people to write about game theory and receptors just because I got into it. I, I got into it because I read a book uh, uh, called um, Soconomics about the sort of uh, the science of soccer and stuff. And I read about the, uh, the game theory that's done between a penalty taker and a, and a goalkeeper and stuff and how, and I realized, oh yeah, that's what receptors do, isn't it? So I just thought, okay, I'll think about how this applies to beta rest and signaling and G-protein signaling. And there's a competition and the receptor is going to choose. And there's a, there's a game being played between the two. And it's fascinating. I go back and I read it now and think, dude, I can't remember how I wrote that because it's really <laughs> smart. And now it's like, 
because once your brain's out of it and like in a different mode yeah. and this is what we were just talking just before we uh we came online uh, about arrival a fantastic movie by Denis Villeneuve about how language controls how you think and the language that we often work in in science is our field in a way and the field that you're in at a certain time can actually change how you approach your science and how you do your science. And I had, uh, when I was at NIH, I had a lab there, and I, I was lucky enough to go to the library one day, and there was the, a talk in the library on this process called natural language processing, which I hadn't heard of before. And I just went on, and it just transformed my view of biomedical data analysis. And it's just changed everything that we've done and it's helped us to really understand and to bring like a new theoretical basis of understanding science just from this superhuman capacity of understanding and taking other people's work so in an odd way i never actually read other people's papers but i sort of do with machine code <laughs> instead so i read millions of them but i don't read them personally so Actually, this is the sort of uh, the one of the things that we're very big on is um, is the capacity to use extra material. So both from bio data, from geo, or from pride, and from people's text, or from electronic medical uh, sort of records. I mean, this is really beyond the scope of any single person. And to apply this to a therapeutic approach and apply this to receptor science that we're doing now has been my new language of the past five or so years but i feel burdened that i have to know i gi i give myself this sort of like this five-year challenge of every five years being different and doing a different thing so my challenge now is to be a pharmacologist after all these years <laughs> and actually start to make drugs uh i mean I, I now live in belgium and we're sort of we are the sort of uh, the home of janssen's pharmaceutica which is uh, run by pal janssen's uh, initially, and he's so well known here and so well respected because he was a drug maker. And his famous phrase that he always used to use to enthuse the people in his company was the patients are waiting. Patients are waiting for drugs. There are people out there that are waiting for drugs. And Janssen's Pharmaceutica just made many, many medications which are still here now and still being used in a generic way. But getting things out there, I mean, now, with the science of repurposing, now with the science of understanding how to analyze the biological effects of those on a historical basis over thousands of patients, you now see the, the worth of having a battery of well-tolerated, effective compounds. You can repurpose them for so many different things. I think it's, uh, so that was my last sort of um, change of language scientifically. So now I'm now saying, okay, we can now make the therapeutic compounds and we can make them to deal with the horrifying complexity that we now understand of receptors. And this was a thing that we started when I was a PhD student and we've realized every single year the receptors are more and more and more complex. Fortunately, the technology that we used to analyze them has got better and better and better and better. And now, so it's a bit of a curse in a way. I mean, my science these days, I used to run thousands of Western blots. Now I just analyze thousands of data sets. <laughs> and it's like, I remember once I had an epiphany. We were, we were writing a bit of a software at NIH called Omnimorph, which turned into a thing mm -hmm. called Pluragon. Actually, half the time we, did, we spend our time coming up with new software names. And uh, <laughs> there's a, a fun story behind that. I had a super, super, super talented intern called Hong Yu Chen. Uh, when I was at NIH and he really helped me a lot with writing a lot of software and he eventually went to work for Google and then his parents said no 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 you're going to do medicine so he's now at Cornell wow. doing med but he's really he's he's much more interested in computational biology but we were, we we wrote this program we had to come up with a new name for it and I'm pretty good at these things and uh, sort of late one night I wrote him an email and I said Textrous with an exclamation mark. It's like, that's the answer, Textrous. And so he said, okay, that's cool. And so he put it on uh, the user interface with an exclamation mark, but I didn't, I didn't mean to do it. It was just like the eureka moment of Textrous <laughs> and that was it. And it's like, it's, you know, it's like Yahoo. It's like stuck ever since. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so when we were doing uh, Omnimorph, we had to uh, create this huge database of mouse and human genes. 
And it was then that I realized that, ah, blimey, this was like, I don't know, 2008, 2009, that Excel runs out of rows eventually. It does. <laughs> it got down to 67,000 rows. And it's like, <laughs> oh, wow, I've burnt Excel and I've killed it. <laughs> uh, of course, now you can't do that now. It's a bit boring, but it was sort of, that was an interesting moment. It's like, dude, this is a lot of data. <laughs> and they got to the end of the row. <laughs> I know. It's, it's sort of like uh, in uh, contact. I, I always use that. I always use that. So contact uh, the sort of the communication. So it's a great book by Carl Sagan about sort of communication of humans with extraterrestrials. And all you have to do is solve pi. If you solve pi to enough digits after the decimal point, it becomes binary. And the binary is the code to make the machine to do interstellar travel to go and meet the aliens. And uh, I, I often sort of, I, I had a book when I was a postdoc all about pi and all about all the numbers. And it's sort of, it's mm -hmm. just such a, a, it encapsulates a lot of complexity science. It's something that is horrendously simple on the get-go, like a cell or like a person getting up. But in that, it's almost infinite complexity. Why is it so? Why is there this mixture between normality as we can see and yet underpinning it is mind-bending complexity it so is. i do that uh, in the first lecture with my class on informatics here i show them a circle and i say okay this circle uh, combines infinity and zero in one object can you imagine that so it's a zero-sided polygon or it's an infinite-sided polygon it's the same thing and it's like just the point is start thinking in a way that you haven't done before. Just blank out everything. Just look at it for what it is. Don't have any presuppositions. And that's... That's hard. The, that's yeah. hard. Especially when, when you're not young and impressionable and you feel like exactly. you, you, don't know, you don't know enough. But that's the thing that we often lose in science because uh, in science education, it's learn stuff, learn stuff, learn stuff, learn stuff, and leave the opinion stuff to the artists. And I am actually an artist at heart who just does science. And that's why I think in a different way. Uh, if I couldn't draw, I couldn't do science. And having that freshness and that creativity is a huge, important thing in science. And by the nature of the subject, the nature of the need to know lots of facts, it starts to dull away uh, that intuitive capacity. There was a recent study showing this, that, that five and six-year-old kids are unbelievably creative. And as they get older and older and older, they get less and less and less and less creative because it's taught out of them. Yes, they get, they get burdened with, with, you know, with the textbook information that you, they must learn mm -hmm. in order to get those grades, in order to go from, from one grade to another. And I think that's, that's unfortunate. Yeah, that is definitely it's definitely unfortunate. Uh, it's a thing, that, so the sort of the spontaneity and, and it's, it's tough now in the days of COVID of not having lab groups and stuff to sort yeah. of, to get across the, the purpose of, you know, this is what I mentioned about, you know, life story right at the start is that we're humans. We're not robots. The work we do can look a bit robotic, but we should have fun and it should be funny and it should be a laugh and it should be lighthearted because if it's not, <laughs> the work's going to kill you. <laughs> it's like, you know, Agreed. the work's tough and it's brutal and it's unforgiving. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, the, the cells don't want to play ball with you. The tissues don't want to work with you. You know, you're trying to like grab this like slippery object, which is reproducibility in biological science, which isn't, you know, it's, if it's there, it's a bit of an illusion because <laughs> you're not really looking deep enough. <laughs> yeah. And that's, and that's the funny thing, though, that actually that, that has rescued me. I wouldn't say rescued, but sort of has transformed science. I, I often describe it as the low dimensionality to the high dimensionality. So low dimensionality science to us back in the day was doing a Western blot and probing <laughs> one protein. And saying, okay, there you go. That's all we can see. Great. No problems. Uh, behind every Western blot is a stream of 18,000 proteins on a mass spectrometer that you can't see. Now we can see it on a daily basis, and it's not a problem at all. And yet you get, you, you, you sort of see, it's like the, 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 the pie in the circle. You yep. get this, oh, there was simplicity, but actually it's underpinned by madness, by this millisecond to millisecond million molecules interacting. And, uh, and yet it's so smooth. And that's fascinating. And that's sort of, it's the grand unifying theory of biology. 
is how do you get from molecule to little baby? It's there yes. and it happens every day. And it's like, it it's, it's in front of your eyes. You don't have to understand quantum physics to Newtonian planetary motions. I mean, that's big and stuff. And that's the big physics question. But the biology question is, is I think we're getting there. It's interesting I, that you mentioned um, West, the simplicity of, of the Western blood, or at least you, you're seeing that band that you're looking for, but then you forget that there is, you know, hundreds of thousands of other proteins that you see on mm -hmm. your mass spec. And I think somewhere in between, there is the scientist yep. that either is, you're missing all the complexity on the Western blot, mm -hmm. but then you can get lost in all the complexity Absolutely. that you can see in, 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 uh, by looking at all those proteins and I think it takes a human or a group of humans mm -hmm. to try and say well it's we're seeing this but this is exact this on the on the mass spec this is what's actually happening and let's try yep. to filter out that information mm -hmm. and see how we can go from filtering out that information to that molecule to that drug I really love the uh, mm -hmm. the quote that you mentioned that people are waiting outside for for that for the drug yeah which, they really are which totally totally makes sense to it's, me it's whenever we're working in, in, on a project or working to understand a, uh, a, a biological phenomenon. I mean, that is an imperative. I mean, it's the thing. This is what I liked about Life Story is that people were rushing and dashing around to try and get it there. It was an academic success of getting the molecule and saying, this is DNA and that's it. Yep. For me, I have far, you know, sort of smaller expectations, but making a therapeutic that goes into someone's arm or, or, or a pill that goes into someone's mouth that helps them, no matter how small or no matter how ineffectual, is life-changing. And I think it's, it's meaningful. It's meaningful in the extreme. And I always, you know, you know as, a, as a lab head and as a manager and as a mentor, and this is what was done for me. So people like Bob and I'll give a big, you know, shout out to Lou Luttrell here because he was really, uh, you know, the most patient person in the world. You know, he was fantastic. I, I've I met him. I was a, a very, very sort of like hardworking and passionate scientist and things go up and down, up and down, up and down. Every single time I go to Lou, don't worry, it's fine, it's cool, we'll sort it out. But positive and calm and, uh, and um, proactive and effective. And I've always tried to remember what that's like and try and do that with the students. And the, the most important thing with new trainees is to say, sure, what you're doing today seems boring and tiny and small and meaningless. But every single time, I put it in the context of the big picture and say, sure, this is a little bit. But this is a little bit on this process. You know, the, the, you know, the journey of a million miles begins with a single step. And this is yeah. what making drugs really are, is that you never know how much of what you're doing right now will make something that will help somebody. And it's just, you know, my, my sort of the best phrase I ever came across. So, you know, all of us, everyone in the world has thought about what is the meaning of life? What is the meaning of life? And I got the answer many years ago, and it's to make the world a better place for other people. That's it. End of, end of sentence. Uh, and I, you, you have instant calm and go, oh, that's it. That was easy. <laughs> We're done now. And that's it. That's all I have to do. Make the world better for other people. And I'm in a science that can do that. And it's sort of, and it's, it's putting in that context and, and placing I mean, you know, we do super high tech stuff, which is super, 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 super esoteric, which only a few people will really know about. But it's going somewhere that, you know, someone down the corridor or, you know, someone in the streets outside can benefit from. And putting the two together is what, you know, I try and do on a daily basis because it's it gets journey. you through, yeah, it's it gets you through, through the boring times. Yep. Through those boring Western blots. <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> that's the hardest thing. It is. It is, and I think I think having having that perspective and knowing where you're going and having someone tell you this this is where we're going. I know this part is really boring, but just let's mm -hmm. just get through it and look at the big picture. And I think in some ways, computational biology and and machine learning and all of these technologies that allow you to look at a large amount of data helps you keep that in, in mind, keep the fact, mm -hmm. the, the, uh, the trajectory in mind and the objective in mind as well, yep. because you can get lost. 
Absolutely. And that is, and, you know, as you said before, this sort of the, the bridging of a big data sheet to a Western board is, and I remember I, I only really got into mass spectrometry at NIH. And I remember I was looking at uh, isolating proteins from lipid rafts and neurons, which is hours of fun, because it means like spinning things down for like 200,000 G for 24 hours. And, you know, if you do it in summer in Baltimore, uh, and in the Biomedical Research Center where we're at on the Hopkins campus, it's right on the top of the hill in Highland Town in Baltimore. And every summer night, it gets hit by lightning and I get like a call from the security saying, oh, your centrifuge has stopped. You've got to come in and do it. Oh, and it's like, oh, dude. Uh, so I remember spending all that time uh, doing all those things. And so eventually I would get like a, a list of 3,000 proteins. I was like, okay. What do we do with it? <laughs> do I look at number one or two or three or four or what do they all mean? And yeah. the scary thing is, is when you sit down and realize, you know, when you look up you know, the problem with, I mean, I, I just deal with protein names every single day and it's so boring. Uh, I really but you get to know them. But then you yes, get to know exactly. them and then you get actually re recognize a name and you tell, you're yep. trying to figure out where that comes from. Absolutely. I, I, I really want to do that like a spelling bee, but for gene symbols. <laughs> uh, I'm sure there's somebody that could blow me away, but I'm pretty good. I've just, I've seen so many over the years. But the, the amazing thing is, is when you sit down and think, oh, well, actually, so, you know, a protein has a name and it has a function, but that function is not what it does. It can do a thousand things. And the scary thing is that thousand things is changed and multiplied or divided or reduced by the protein just after it in the list. And then those first two were changed by the protein that's third in that list. And it's like, oh, that's dimensionality, isn't it? And if I have a list of 15, then I have 18 million, I have 80, uh, I have like 80 billion dimensions of complexity in there. It's like, that's ridiculous. That's absolutely ridiculous. So dealing with that, that, that seemed to me to be the only problem. We can collect vast amounts of data that are probably, I mean, you can easily sample 10 to 40% of a proteome of a cell or a tissue easily. Think, oh, wow. If I can measure all these things, I must get the answer in there. And that's the beauty. That's, that's, the, that's our version of putting together the ATGC that Watson and Crick did is that, oh, in this data set that no, one, that no human has ever seen before, the answer's in there. But you just can't get it. It's, it's sort of, yeah. it's like the heuristic solution. It's like we do a lot. And so one of the ways we try and deal with this horrifying complexity is we turn data into objects because objects are really easy to understand and classify and appreciate. And it's what we call dimensional condensation. So that the number of dimensions in a big data set are gargantuan. You can condense it into something that's three-dimensional, which is what we live and breathe all the time. It's called topological data analysis, and we love it. We because we got to do it. I know 2010, we were doing like 3D printing of objects, from data sets, and stuff. And it's like you can touch it, and it's great. I always do that with my students. It's like I bring a box with a not with a plurigon in it, and they can touch it. And it's like, yeah, that's someone's data. That's like 16,000 data points printed. But you can look at it really easily. If I show you the Excel spreadsheet, you'll go, "What does it mean?" So we do that to sort of, you know, we create these little tiny mini worlds of data, essentially. And topology is, is what we're used to looking at. I mean, it's like, so you end up having to learn about, you know, eigenvectors and Euler geometry and stuff. But it's, it's sort of fascinating because it's a way that we are, we're actually very good at it. Humans are slightly better than machines at the moment of looking at object structures. I always... I, I always used to do this thing. So we actually did this largely to understand about complex diseases like Alzheimer's and dementia, which, mm -hmm. you know, outside of the genetic causes are sporadic and there's no obvious cause for them. So I'd always do this in a lecture of, of showing, uh, actually, I could do it smarter now, but I always used to show like a, a, um, a shark and a dolphin and say, look, these are totally different organisms, but they're more or less the same because they do the same thing. That's why they look the same because they're under the same pressure and do the same thing. So perhaps objects of data do the same thing. So that's what we try to analogize. And so basically, if you can transform complex data sets into structures, then you can look for convergence analogies between them and start to subclassify patients or even drug mechanisms. Okay.
at a super dimensionality level. See, now my kiddies are obsessed with dinosaurs. So now I do a much better presentation of that because I'd have an ichthyosaurus and a shark and a dolphin and they all look the same. <laughs> one's a dinosaur, one's a sort of, you know, megalodon type dinosaur thing and the other one's a mammal. And it's like, dude, they're all the same, totally different structures, but they've, they've converged. And it's sort of, you know, bridging, you know, getting people to conceptualize these horrifyingly complex things. It's the most important thing. You can, al you can always analogize something really easily, very quickly. And people are quite, I think often some people are averse to it because they don't want to dumb science down or make it too easy. But dude, Brevity is the soul of genius. It's like really, and it's a thing that I'm definitely not a genius because I'm not brave in my writing. <laughs> but interesting. Artistically, I can do it. I can really do it. So it's, uh, so my, you know, whenever I do presentations, I, I was blown away. I went to a talk once in Melbourne and it was a talk by Michael Berich, who is a genius of calcium dynamics. And normally if someone said, oh, you're going to watch a talk on calcium sequestration and dynamics, you go, no. <laughs> but he spoke for an hour with no words and just pictures. And I was just blown away. I thought, wow, that was so wonderful. And it's like, it's, 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 it, it's a bit like, you know, it's like, imagine just having a long form science podcast and stuff. And yeah. it's like, you could, as a kid, honestly, I would lap these things up so much because it's, I mean, this is the purpose of sort of, what we're doing is is a bit of humanity behind the science and not just standing behind a lectern and giving standard scientific talk because that's so constraining and it's i, it I try and break out of that so much it it's, is constraining uh, because i think it's it's just i feel like it's just so square when i think about it it's like mm -hmm. a box that you you either fit into it or you don't Mm -hmm. And I think being able to to talk for an hour about something like calcium uh, and just with images, I think it shows yeah. a lot. It, it shows that you're really you, you're in control of your of of the science. You understand mm -hmm. the science inside and out. And right. You went we were just talking about this right before we hit record. We're talking about Jordan Peterson. Mm -hmm. And I think in order If you if you if you can talk about it in an analogy and you can simplify complex uh, events or complex things in general, that means that you understand it inside and out. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that's how it shows. If you can find an analogy where where you can show it off to people who are not necessarily experts in the field, but then you can make them understand a concept. Which, Absolutely. Which I think it's just amazing when you can do that. As a scientist, it, it's 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 such a funny thing. I can I can actually remember. So uh, this was when I was a, a PhD student, and there's one of the lecturers, the University of Leeds, Ian Hughes, and he's saying, "Oh, there's this new program coming out called PowerPoint." And it's like, "Wow, it's amazing!" Because <laughs> before then, we had those Blue Azo slides. Can you believe? It's like, and and I still have them at home still. Uh, but it sort of reminds me. I watched this wonderful program once about the. Um, the discovery and the generation and the, the industrialization of uh, personal cameras. And it was all about Kodachrome. And it was, it, it was the fact that the film was not very sensitive at the start. So with your new camera, they would give you an instruction manual of, oh, stand with the sun behind your back and take pictures of people. And what that did is it made every single person's picture on the planet look the same. Because people only took pictures on the beach and pic and the photographer would always have the sun behind their okay. back because they get illumination. So the nature of the, 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 the actual tool determined the structure of the content. And it's yes. the same with PowerPoint and other forms of presentation structure. I've had students use Prezi on me and it's like it gets nauseating after a while. It does. <laughs> I've tried that. It's cool. Yeah, it's, it's cool, cool, but it's hard. But yeah. I mean, God bless them. I mean, at least it's different. But yeah, I really feel the need to break out of the standard mode. But I, it actually warms my, warms my heart when I see the occasional blue 
background <laughs> gold the yellow. Letter. It's like, oh, classic. It's like, dude, this is like, this is this is like nostalgia. It's like Stranger Things, but like, you know, just as like a PowerPoint presentation. But I would never do it again. But it's, uh, but yeah, I've 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 desperately tried to, uh, you know, because I mean, it's one of the things that we do. We often we do a lot of image analysis. You know, we can turn things into objects. We can turn things into images. We are, you know, the the data that is contained within an image is beyond uh, any sort of data stream that you have. So why don't we apply that to dissemination and discussion? Why don't we try and crystallize things into pictures? And so it's sort of, you know, text on a slide. You've got to stop it. It's like you, it should be, I, I often tell people it's a background. You know, it's sort of, uh, it's, it's, it's there to n make Often with students, when they're, they're doing presentations, I try and tell them that they're talking to a mixed audience. There are some listeners, there are some readers, and there are some visual people. And you've got to hit everyone. And it's sort of, and that's, you know, to talk about another thing that is sort of like part of science is the paper, the manuscript. It's very old-fashioned still. It's really quite, and some journals and some things are trying to break out of it and have different sort of forms, but it's anti-message. I mean, dude, it's like, you know, I can, I, I can remember when I first moved to NIH, we took a cab in Baltimore. And so got in the cab and the guy asked us, oh, where do you work? And I said, NIH. He goes, NIH, what's that? So, oh, it's that big building behind you, dude. <laughs> it's oh like, you know, <laughs> it's your National Institutes of Health that you pay for that does all the research for you. And it's like, it's unbelievable. I mean, it should be. And you know, if you look at your average standard paper, I mean, when I was a, you know, when I was a student and a kid, you would often go into like a news agent, and they would have science and nature or mm -hmm. Omni or Scientific American in there. And it's sort of, that's gotten less now because of print changes. But also, I mean, who's going to read them and pick them up apart from scientists? No one. No one's going to. No, no one. one. And it's like, it shouldn't be like that. It's, it, there's no, I mean, even if you read a paper, you don't read all of it. You just look at the best bits and look at the figures and that's it. So why not just do that? And it's sort of, I understand from a point of view of propriety and putting the data around stuff, but other people might be interested. And it's sort of, you know, uh, it, it, it's a difficult process. I think in a way, you know, sort of, you know, medicine can be simplified. People understand and people discuss and also clinicians are trained to communicate then their part of their job is communicate with lay people as scientists we don't often get that so we need to sort of really improve that tendency. and this is what we do with kinds of science and other types of outreach experience is you know i think it's important in two ways number one is to say that look we're people we do stuff we're just like you but we do science yep. and number two is science isn't that difficult to understand and you know, if you can do it in that way, people get engaged and people understand and people appreciate. And one of the topics we were talking about before was to take some sort of agency in the biomedical life, that it is possible to do things. You don't have to be passive. I mean, you know, pharmacology, we're here to make medications for people, but people can also, I mean, if there's one thing that we've been trying to do in the past 10 to 15 years with aging research is to understand natural processes that everyone knows, like diet and exercise. It's the most yeah. boring, oh, diet and exercise, diet and exercise, diet and exercise. They do sort of work, but why and how? And can we boil it down? Can we understand it? It's not just one thing. Yeah. It's not just one protein, but it's this beautiful synergy of systems across your whole body. And it's unprecedented in the levels of understanding. And this is what one of the things that we're really passionate about is looking, is, is breaking down how we look at a body is rather than looking at it from a classical, you know, sort of uh, uh, organotypic or structural point of view, but look at it as, as the as world of receptors. Yeah. As a whole. How, to did, see. how did you get into, into studying aging and where is, uh, where, where did that come from? Because you've talked about pharmacology, yeah. about GPCRs, yeah. and obviously where we both, and I think the audience also agrees that GPCRs are the most important receptors <laughs> ever. And everybody should drop everything what they're do that they're doing and work on GPCRs. <laughs> but how, well, how, did, how did you get into, into that? Aging. Well, this is an interesting thing. So uh, 
as you get older, you try and think about your career. But I've not really thought about my career that much. I've thought about what I am interested in and also who I'm with. So my wife, who I met at the Medical Research Council, and she was doing a PhD in reproductive endocrinology there, uh, she wanted to find a job. So she interviewed in a few places like Yale and NIH and stuff, and she was offered a job there. So we thought, okay, let's go. Let's go to the National Institute on Aging, and that's it. And it was mainly because her beloved grandfather was suffering from what we now think is frontotemporal dementia, but back then it was probably Alzheimer's and dementia. So we went to work uh, at NIH. You know, a lot of the push there was on aging-related research linked mm -hmm. to dementia. So it was for my future wife, really, that was interest. And but by applying, and this is the beautiful thing. So with GPCRs, if you have an understanding and an interest in them, you can work anywhere and do anything. But what it really did, so, you know, when I was a student, amazingly enough, um, during my PhD, we sort of, um, we, we, we sort of generated the first sort of concepts of bias signaling. We didn't know what it really was, but what I did was I was looking at desensitization rates and I realized that I could uh, uh, sort of uh, quantify desensitization as a figure and look at different types of receptor mutants and different types of ligands and quantify the amount and the rate of desensitization. So to me, I was looking at it as a positive signal. Now, I went to work with Bob and I realized, oh, yeah, that's beta arresting, isn't it? <laughs> and it's sort of, you know, so our signaling, we were measuring, but we weren't quantifying it as a positive beta arresting signaling process. So then the box was open. So you go from G proteins to beta arrestins. And then a lot of the work I was doing with people like Lou and Yahir uh, was looking at the complexes of G proteins. And so we used to call it the Pentium complex because we had like five things in there and Pentium chips were a big thing there. So how old is that? Can anyone even remember what a Pentium <laughs> chip was? But uh, the receptor kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger and more and more complex. It was binding EGFRs, it was binding Dynamin, Sark, Beta Arrestin, you name it, kept going on and on and on and on and on. So uh, then uh, I transferred that to look at how receptors would bind to different proteins and different tissues, and then mm -hmm. you get tissue-specific functionalities with generate receptors, which solved a big problem there. So every year, you know, our lab mugs in Edinburgh used to sort of say that um, it's always more complex than you think. Always more complex than you think. And then when I moved into the aging field, I sort of thought, oh, interesting. So this complexity, right, that lasts about 75 to 80 years. So what's the likelihood that this complexity is maintained with perfect fidelity for all of those years and all of those milliseconds? It's like, that's got to be zero, right? There's no way that the receptor signaling systems are the same in young as it is in old. I'm sure there'll be some systems that are retained, but it's, this is a nightmare to maintain. So that's how we got into yeah. this concept, which has gotten into dynamic complexity and to understanding really, you know, it, it was an eye opener to us to, to realize that you have to then, you know, you have to think about the, the age of a receptor system and how it responds, and then how it interacts with other systems through the aging process. It's a thing that we don't often do in biology enough, is, you know, in a way, it's, it is like this grand unifying theory, but it's temporal. So how do you connect the nanosecond events to the lifespan events? And from a therapeutic point of view, that is really important, because you know that the receptor system is a super complex receptor zone structure. That's changing all the time, all the time. And it's got a huge capacity to affect which ligand it interacts with, how it binds, how it signals. And so that was the sort of toe in the water of, oh, it really is complex. <laughs> and it was sort of, uh, it's, it, it, it gets even bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. It's so, interesting. Please go ahead. Yeah, so uh, that's when I realized, oh, the only thing we have to sort out is this complexity theory thing. Is how do you deal with organization in complex systems? And I was on a plane once, and I don't often read on a plane. I always take a book on a plane and think, oh, yes, I'll read it. and will be fine. Lots of work done. And you just force it or watch a movie, and that's it. <laughs> but I was reading this book on networks, and I read up about uh, Watson Strogatz and their small world network theories and how it hit me. You know, sort of I thought, oh, 
actually that a lot of biological systems have these things called loose connectors, which are these sort of temporal bridges across complex systems that really control functionality. But the real problem is, is they're fragile. They change in millisecond bases. And they're not there all the time. They're not like the, the nuts and bolts of a system. They're the sort of the, the interactors. And this is why people don't see them because they're contextual. They're, they're, it's sort of a bit like, um, but when I was a kid, I used to read Stephen Jay Gould. I was fascinated by evolutionary theory. And um, there were all the books. I mean, you can see what a complete nerd I was. I didn't read, I don't read fiction. My kids love fiction. I used to read books on evolutionary theory when I was 12. How boring is that? But it was uh, when the Burgess Shale discoveries were done and all of these like crazy hallucinogenia and opabenia organisms were found in the Burgess Shale from 600 million years ago. People thought, oh, wow, these animals don't exist anymore that there was this, this, this punctuated equilibria concept of like massive radiation of craziness and then shrinking again. And then it explodes again and then shrinks again and explodes again. And it's not based on preordination and destination to humans. It's just based on how did you survive that disaster? How did you survive the, the, the Silurian devastation? Or how did you survive the asteroid? And it sort of made me realize that, that, that nature in every single sense wants to be stable. And the, inter, the intervening periods between stability are this magic mystery hour of things changing. And the bridges, and so this is over billions of years. This, this happens every millisecond in your cell. Things change. I mean, it's like, it's like with aging of receptor systems, things change, you know, every single millisecond, every single cell. And it's like, wow. How do you deal with that? How do you predict or deal with millisecond changes? So then we got into this concept of looking for these things, looking for these mysterious loose connectors. It's a bit like, you know, Sasquatch. You know, primates are stable, humans are stable. The in-between, uh, it's been and gone. Them, yeah. It wasn't stable, but there had to be an intermediate. There had to be a Bigfoot or something. And so we were looking for these things because we thought, wow, this are the most important things to deal with how to control systems across minutes or a lifespan. So in these, we actually found out that one of the proteins was, interestingly enough, one of those was discovered in Bob's lab by super talented guy, Richard Primon, uh, called Git1 and Git2. And Git2, it mm -hmm. seems, is one of these, you know, mystical proteins that flits in and out of the importance in biology. It by itself is not everything but it's the bridge and it's a contextual bridge and we think it's a decision maker and those things are actually just as important as the uh the status of the cell or the status of the organism is the things that you know the bigfoots that allow a jump from stable to unstable and back to stable again so it's looking at the system and seeing the receptor as you know, it really is one of those bridges because it makes a lot of sense. Because if you're in a position where you're changing biology, you need to sense it somehow. And the sensors are GPCRs. So it's unsurprising that there are GPCR associated factors that are involved in the molecular sensing systems of cells and tissues. And it's sort of, we've been working on that, I would say, for about 10 years. So it's time for something else. It's cool, but we've got it. And it's like, in a way, career-wise, it's a disaster. Because people usually tell me, just like, do one thing and stick with it and blah, blah, blah. I don't like that. And it's, it's sort of painful and brutal to have to reinvent and change and add and modify. But that's me. But that's and what makes it worth it. Yeah. You can't you can do the same thing over and over and over again and expect to have the same success rate or the same or, you know, a better outcome. It's like whenever you're doing something, you're baking a cake and you don't have the right mm -hmm. measurements, you have to innovate, you have to change something. Exactly. Keep on doing the same thing over and over again. Cake number one versus cake number 50 is going to look the same because you haven't mm -hmm. changed anything. And it's so interesting that you mentioned that um, uh, the, I've never thought about the receptor complex over time. And now that you mention it, it makes so much sense 
that everything, not only the receptor, but the cells and the components and the environment changes. So obviously everything. with aging, there must be a change that a, a natural change that has to happen. Mm -hmm. That's what I, that's, so I mentioned <laughs> latrophilin earlier on. That's what, uh, so when I was uh, postdocing with Bob, uh, the Methuselah paper came out and everyone was really excited. So this was like 2000 or so. Uh, and uh, they were just doing uh, mutagenic and stress experiments in flies. And they knocked out this one gene and the flies lived forever and could eat paraquat and survive anything. They called it <laughs> Methuselah. And it turned out to be a GBCR uh, for ligands called stunted A and stunted B. And for the life of me, we, I couldn't find at the time a human analog. The nearest thing was the latrophilin receptor. And I thought, wow. This is super cool. This is like a death receptor. This is like your body's way of telling you time's up and time to finish and stuff. And it's sort of, I, I, I worked about a year and a half on that and didn't really get anywhere, but it was just such a cool concept. There are times when you've just got to do it because it's the itch you've got to scratch yeah. scientifically. And sometimes it really works and other times perhaps not, but you secretly think it would work if I had the time. And it's sort of, we all have a backlog of fascinating cool results that never really panned out or we never really got to the bottom of and mm -hmm. it's uh that's the the beauty in a way of science is often a lot of discoveries are like that that the inconsequential or the funky uh if once they start to be stable and you start to see it then that's actually really important and i've done we did a i had a, a phd student in edinburgh called lindsay davidson who's a very smart guy and just from an observation, we wrote a whole paper that said, oh, look, when I, when I apply generation to these cells, they don't fall off in the same way as the other ones. I thought, really? So what we did is we did, just did this very simple experiment of just like stimulating the cells with good generation and putting them on a, on a plate shaker. And, see, and we just counted how many came off after 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 minutes. And like, yeah, wow. it was a beautiful assay for cytoskeletal dynamics and stuff. It was, so, it was so obvious and so silly, we had to do it. So we put it in the paper. Goodness. So it's just, it's like sort of practical science, an observation and a result and a paper in like 18 months, no problems. And I always tell students, the most important thing you can do is observe. Just, just, you know, tell me what the cells look like, because that's a lot of it. That's a lot of it. Healthy cells look beautiful. Unhealthy cells don't look pretty. And it's simple because, you know, what you're looking at is a condensate. You're looking at millions of things condensed into a cell. It's not fluff yeah. and it's not stuff. It's like, you know, in the aging field, a lot of us are very, and actually this is now the same for a lot of uh, DNA damage disorders that we're very interested in, is looking at someone's face. You know, your face is a wonderful condensation of all the trillions of biochemical reactions that this going on in your body when you when you when you don't feel well you don't look well yeah. it's very rare that someone looks healthy and happy but they're sick it's very rare so aging you can crunch down to the corner of your eye you can predict someone's age just from the wrinkles in the corner of their eye or now they do these things called facial gestalts where basically they overlay the faces of children or adults with related conditions and you get to see this standard bloom syndrome face or the standard face and it's a thing that you can do with children to get early diagnosis of certain disorders because there are facial attributes that you can't that you sort of a trained person would see it but uh, an untrained person you know and and potentially in the future we can start to you know it's like doing 23 and me and getting a perfect rundown <laughs> of your genetic history you could get a health rundown just from your face and yeah. a guy called Jay Lansky does this quite a lot and because it's handy because especially if you work with Facebook, people donate their pictures all the time. Yes, <laughs> There's lots do. and lots and lots and lots of pictures. Yes, uh, so it's, it's sort of, I think it's a perfect indication of how biology really works is that the complexity is translated because you can't, I mean, it's sort of like the, the network connectors. If you have one super big network and another super big network, they don't all bash into each other and form like a node to node connection. It would be crazy. They talk to each other through something very small and simple, which can talk. It's the same way with humans. I mean, our brain's full of billions and billions of things, but we don't, well, 
I do. Really bad example. <laughs> I do tell everyone everything whenever I meet them. Uh, but we communicate in simple terms and we break things down and we get to the point. And it's like, yeah, yeah that's communication, isn't it? <laughs> and it's like, and once you start to, you know, it's like, you know, thinking and the language that you have controls how you think. I really try and do that in the lab. And that's why we talk and the, the way we talk and how we talk about things. And this is a difficult thing because we spend all of our time talking in this way and talking with these concepts. And to us, it's like normal. Then we go out and we tell somebody else and they go, what are you talking about? And it's, it's, it's sort of, it's nice in a way because, you know, you have to get people at the same level to then cross fertilize. But then it's always a, a challenge to translate that across. And that's sort of when I try and talk and talk about simple concepts. And you can do it because that's how nature does it. It doesn't communicate in a crazy way. It condenses complex signals into simple entities. And the funny thing is it's this sort of hundred number, this hundred number. It's sort of like, you know, we have 24,000 proteins and up. Uh, but the question is how many really control diseases? Technically, all proteins bind each other at some point. It's about a bridge of 5.6 proteins between each other. Uh, it's you know, the six degrees of Kev Baker, uh, you know, the Milgram experiment. But it's sort of the magic number seems to be that, you know, if you look at the correlation of number of proteins involved in a complex system and the number of proteins you need to measure to be able to distinguish between condition A and condition B, it's about 100. And it seems to be very consistent for lots and lots and lots of different diseases. It's sort of this, yeah, it's a bit like Fibonacci. It's, it, it's like this magical number of uh, sort of biology. And the interesting thing is, so my roommate at college was um, a mathematician and he ended up working for an encryption company uh, for mobile phones. And what they do is they use 100 digit prime numbers because they're virtually impossible to predict and they're very hard to get, very hard to calculate. But if you have 100 digits, it's sort of like the bottom end of infinite complexity. The, the likelihood that you will get the two numbers overlapping onto each other, it's sort of, it's the first point in number science where you have totally unlimited uh, coding capacity. And so it's this magical level of encryption and I think that's why we see it in biology, because, and this was another one of my completely overlooked and unknown papers, <laughs> <laughs> was like, was, was trying to bridge, you know, what really happened. So for many of us, when we started out, you would do the standard, standard, standard experiment. And I did this many times with beta-2 and isoproteranol. You take cells, you serum deprive them, and you give them a ligand. And you go, oh, that's what happens. It's like, no, 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 no. That's not what happens. You don't get equilibrium, you don't get concentration uh, exposure at that time point, and you don't have one ligand at a time. So how the hell does the cell know if all of these proteins in these signaling networks can potentially interact? At any one point in time, you might have 10, 20, 30, or 40 impinging ligands on a single cell. How does the cell decode it? How does it know? Where does it put the grab to? Where does it put the shake? How does it know? So we did this experiment in like 2008, uh, of just simultaneously stimulating cells with different growth factors and seeing the difference between the output signals, between the theoretical composite and the actual composite. And they're very different. And you think, ah, okay. So what we, I came up with this phrase called an encrypton, because it sounds like something from Star Trek. So basically every time a ligand will bind a receptor, it, it will make a unique entity, a unique receptosome structure or, or, you, or a unique signaling structure. But you have to have an infinite number of capacities for those because you have a near infinite number of potential scenarios of ligand stimulation that could exist in a cell. So that's where we think this, this hundred factor number seems to come from. You need a capacity to have almost infinite levels of encryption because the complexity that you might be dealing with might be unbelievably large. And it's sort of, it's quite pretty in a way to sort of realize that, you know, like with pie, there has to, nature is always beautiful. Always. It's the beautiful solution. That's always the natural solution. It's, you know, it, 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 and I love that in a way because you sort of get to feel it 
and you get and I've been today's been a nightmare. Today's been an absolute brain crunching nightmare of complexity to deal with a problem that we're working on with a, a new animal model. And I'm starting to see the magic in it now. I'm starting to see the the sort of the 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 convergence of you know these seemingly disparate pathway analysis results that I've been getting that I'm starting to see what's bridging between them. And it's a difficult and painful process to get there. It really is. It is because it's it's not something you don't know it yet and you have yeah. to be exposed to to you know that disturbing I want to say image of data. Yes. And then your brain is trying to make sense of it. But then I feel like in my case, my brain would go from scenario to scenario and trying to recall what has what I've yep. seen before and go, Absolutely. and go to there up until the point where you just you say to yourself, I'm going on a walk because I just have no idea yep. how to analyze that data. And that, that's when the magic happens, when it you was, stop thinking about it. It was funny. A couple of weeks ago, I was doing that and I sort of embarked on like a, an informatic uh, escapade, I would call <laughs> it now. And I w it took, when I was about 25 or 30% of the way into it, I was thinking to myself, is this crazy what I'm doing? Is this going to be worth it? I don't know. So I went home the next day and told my wife, oh, I'm still doing this thing. Oh, it's taking me forever. Oh, it's driving me crazy. And she told me, is it worth doing? What the hell are you doing? Come on. Is this really worth it? I said, I don't know yet. I don't know if it's worth it or not yet because I'm in, I'm, I haven't reached the peak and I don't know if it's any good or not. And it's a funny process to get in. And it's sort of, we've come across this many times. We thought, oh, is, there, is this a smart way or is this really stupid? And we're not sure. And even when you've done it, you go, was that smart or was that stupid? I'm not sure. It's turned out to be really good though. But it's one. It's 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 a gamble, and Always. all of the yeah. I think you have to be a bit of a a risk taker in science. And I I think as long as and this is what I like about a lot of the science that we do is that it seems very procedural in the fact that it's this like this algorithm, this data, these cutoffs, this enrichment, blah 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 blah. blah. But you can see it, and you can trace back exactly where you got to. The end stage seems magical and funky, as though it's come out of, bing, just come out of the ether. But it hasn't. It's come out of a long series of mathematical steps. It's just that if you show somebody, oh, here's the end, end thing, and you go, wow, how did you get that? It's like, yeah, it was really tedious and really lots of grunt work. But I love that in a way, is that, you know, often uh, we used to have a lot of medical students and, you know, they used to hate science because they, oh, you know, if they're doing MD, PhDs or something, oh, you do so much science and nothing comes out of it. But if I study for medicine, I can pass things and I learn things yeah. and that's it. And it's sort of, I like the science that we do now because it is more like that. The effort and grind work you put in in computational bio actually does come out. Even if it's a stupid idea, you can rescue it as long as what you're doing is good and right at each step and it's sort of i've really appreciated that enormously uh and i sort of i haven't rejected and got rid of you know classical wet low dimensionality science because you always have to do it and it's always important to see it but once you get out of that and once you look behind the curtain and see the wizard behind the curtain you go oh right okay do i have to just like do this forever now and it's like i and uh, I just tell people a mass spectrometer is just a mega Western machine. That's all it is. We're just doing 10,000 <laughs> Westerns. And that's it. Yeah. Uh, at the same time. Less really brushes expensive. too. <laughs> Abs Less oh, brushes. absolutely. Much nicer. Much nicer. And there's nothing worse than a dirty Western bulb. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, you can have dirty MS data as well, but you can clean it up and no one sees it. So yeah, it's, sort of, okay. it's a bit easier in that way. But it's sort of, it, it's amazing to think of where I started to, I mean, I've, I've sort of worked in many fields, pain, cardiovascular science, reproductive, molecular gerontology. Here we've worked on neurodegenerative diseases. I work on carotid artery stiffening. I work on psychoaffective disorders, GPCRs, bridge all that. And the more disease systems and the more functions I've worked on, the more we've realized 
that aging really underpins all these things. And aging is not just aging. Aging is damage. Aging is unrepaired damage. And that's what causes disease to a certain extent. And I always have to say these things. It's like saying uh, g protein independent signaling. People hate that. It's like, no, 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 it's not independent of g protein. It's always g protein. So I've, I've killed off that phrase now because I've had too many reviewers say, no, 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 you can't say it's g protein independent. <laughs> It's, you know, I've, I've changed that phrase now, uh, but it was just sort of like a, a period of time. But everything at a certain way is, even diseases that we used to use, when we used to do early aging research, we used to look for things that were aging independent. But now all the things that we think are aging independent are still aging independent, but just in a different way. Just because it's not time, it doesn't mean that it's not the same damage process. And the damage process is just it's as plain as the nose on your face it's like it's you incur damage every single day it's inevitable it there's no perfect system so you will always acquire damage the question is how quickly do you acquire it how quickly does it affect important systems and then how quickly do you express the disease and how beautiful and, is this when you think about it is that you're chronically exposed to well to to time aging mm -hmm. you're chronically you have a genetic predisposition which pay, takes takes place you're going through time your cells receptor complexes and then you have also this this delicate balance of you know having having disruption a disruption in a system that may mm -hmm. or may not cause disease but then again that balance is so it's it's so tiny from mm -hmm. oh we're rescuing the system to the point where no actually we've went through that stage where you have actually the disease and we were talking right before mm -hmm. we hit record about diabetes about yep. type 2 diabetes mm -hmm. where yes you if you have the disease there is also a way to come back and modulate that system exactly and i think it's just beautiful that all of these players can allow you to modulate the system one way or another. And exactly. it's, just, it's just fascinating. And that's the sort of, that's why I like reaching the depths that we have of understanding, because a lot of people would see extra complexity as a problem. Actually, what it means is more potential solutions, because yes. not everyone will be disrupted in the same way. I mean, this is the beautiful thing with type 2 diabetes. It's potentially one of the most prevalent disease in the world, apart from cardiovascular disease or cancer. But blimey, every single person's diabetes is different from every other person's diabetes. You can quantify it and you can put people in a bracket, you know, like we discussed before, about, oh, oh your MIGS per DL is slightly higher here, therefore you're down. And it's like, no, 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 no. You haven't tested enough people and you don't know enough glycotypes to really say that. I mean, it's, it's a personal disease. And... You know, but the understanding how complex that really is doesn't give you added problems. It gives you added therapeutic solutions. And I think realizing, I mean, this is actually, this is how it intersects beautifully with the aging process. I mean, all of the first aging genes discovered were involved in the insulinotropic system, PR3 kinase, AKT, insulin receptor, IGF-1, you name it. It was it's indicative of the, the importance and the relevance of the glucose system because, you know, this is a good story from Bob Miller. It's like, you know, we're just made to, you know, reproduce and that's it. But actually there's an extra step is that we're made to live, eat something and then reproduce and then die. And that's it. That's all we do. And we can do a bit of thinking in the meantime, but that's an optional extra. <laughs> but it's sort of, it, it's sort of, it's so fundamental and yet from a therapeutic point of view, we, we treat it like a relatively simple system. And there's way more ways into this. And the ways we know best, I and mean, this is why fasting is such a, a core factor of many societies and many religions. All religions and all societies have ritual fasts. And this is not, you know, this is not space aliens coming and telling us this. It's us learning it through experience and building it into our society that it is good for you. And it's, you know, it's good for your immune system. It's good for your general health. It's also good for your mental health as well to know that you can resist. And this is why we have Lent and Ramadan. And it's like, it's, yeah. it's, it's part of us, but it's also part of the biology. And that's the really interesting thing is our customs and history and behavior is intrinsically linked to our biology. And that's one thing 
the high dimensionality science that allows us to do, because it allows you to stand back and have this 30,000 foot view and all the madness of the molecules graze out and you start to see a smooth picture. You go, ah, that's what it is. That's why it works. Down at the mental reduction levels, how the hell does that work? It's emergence. It's, it's like the water molecule and the oceanic currents. You only see the oceanic currents at the macro level. You don't see them at an individual right. molecule level because it doesn't exist there. And, you know, I've read books on emergence and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, it's just wonderful to see how fractal-like everything really is. And understanding diseases in that way, I think, is really important because it actually shows you potentially uh, parallel mechanisms to control a disease. It's, you know, it's like this goes back to, you know, some really seminal work that was actually done a lot uh, by my wife and also myself at Hopkins, where we realized that, you know, diseases of the gut were diseases of the brain and vice versa, is that, you know, Huntington's disease and Parkinson's disease were gut disorders and gut disorders of gut motility and gut functionality and uh, glucose-related hormones. All of these were involved in regulating everything and your taste perception and your olfactory perception are all linked in with cognitive functions and that's this sort of, you know, emergent functionality of these things. And yet, the nuts and bolts of those complex and emergent systems are therapeutically tractable. And that's the real beauty of understanding the two ends of the system, is that we, you know, drugs existed before we had receptors. And so we know that this is a mechanism of how these things work. You know, toxins work through these things. That, you know, spiders have never seen a, a receptor, but they know how. But they know it's an effective way in to control the central nervous system of another organism. It's nature's way, and this is what we're trying to do. But thankfully, because now we can see things in a natural way, where we're not hindered by the myopia of like an individual molecule, we can actually understand how to make a therapeutic that looks like you getting exercise or you dieting or you eating a certain food because we understand that those things are multidimensional and, and it's sort of it's creating like a, a natural balance therapeutic i always use the sort of jelly on the table analogy of like you know a disease is like a jelly and you just push it with one finger and your finger just goes into the jelly and the jelly doesn't move but if you Put all of your fingers against the jelly. You can push it across the table. So you you sort of, you know, complex systems only respond to other complex inputs. They don't respond to single point of contact in, inputs like good old-fashioned monolithic drugs. You know, <laughs> polypharmacology has always been there. Now we know how to do it because we know how to identify those systems and target them. And it's sort of... It's, it's sort of, you know, everyone talks about rational drug design, blah, blah, blah. But this is rational drug design at the gestalt level of saying, oh, all of these things are important. And all of these systems across multiple tissues, tissues that you thought were not important in the disease process, there are easy ways in to control systems because it is one big system. I was uh, quoted that once when I was talking to the Washington Poster many years ago about you just have to hit the the right key in the, in the thing and the whole system responds and that's it and it is more or less true because that's you you have to have those key points otherwise you can't have a complex system you do have master controllers you have sub controllers and you have regulators and otherwise there'd be no hierarchy and there'd be no organization so only by standing back and appreciating them can you really see them Exactly, but you need you need the tools as well to be able to stand back yeah. and to to be at that mm -hmm. you know thirty thousand feet yep. uh, height to actually see beyond the complexity. Mm -hmm. And I, I yep. love I love the idea of being able well the, the fact that you are able to stand up high and see the complexity and differentiate between what's very, what's important and what mm -hmm. is crucial. And that, exactly. that's what yes, you mentioned, uh, rational drug design. I've, yeah. It may be just, just me, but in my mind, usually when, when people go about talking about a drug or talking about compounds to modulate a disease, there's a focus on one 
series of events or one yep. series of molecular events, which then again gives rise to all these side effects. Mm -hmm. Because you were thinking about that particular system, but then when yep. you realize that, I don't know, taste receptors are also expressed in the gut, yep. mm -hmm. you yep. haven't taken those into account. I, I love I love the idea of, you know, taking that step back and exploring it in a totally different way yep. than the mainstream. It's sort of it's sort of a bit like you know it's 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 an analogy of like you know if your computer's not working you know a good old fashioned drug would be just to kick it and hope <laughs> it works. Well, now like it's, it. this is software exactly. This is like software. Our drugs should be seen as software for the human machine because at a certain level it is a hyper 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 complex yeah. machine. And so why do we think a simple solution will work for a hyper complex process? It's not going to. And it's, it's an issue. I mean, journals have been trying to deal with this for years. The, the idea, I mean, once routine high dimensionality data was attainable in most labs, uh, I mean, still very expensive. I mean, still our machines cost millions and millions of euros. And it's not normal that you have those as your machines in your lab. You would have blocks and blah, blah, blah. Uh, but this is what we've invested in. We've invested heavily in our own machines. And so we just, they're just everything we do. We, I mean, it's very simple in a way. We never look at anything only at low dimensionality. The first thing we do is high dimensionality. And then we focus down. We want to assess the landscape and then look for the key factors in the landscape. Because we know our interventions. I mean, if we go to the FDA and say, oh, well, we're going to measure 3,000 outputs of efficacy, blah, blah, blah. They go, no, 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 you're not doing that. And also, you can't organize studies because then the concept of power, of power analysis, is, all, is largely based on clinical readouts like blood pressure or yeah. blood sugar. They're not based on the interconnection and, and pathway enrichment of 400 factors. It's just not how we assess drug functionality. It really has to be because it's actually that's a much better predictor of eventual functionality of a compound. You know, if you measure one or two things, fine. If you measure 400 things, dude, you're a guarantee. Better. Yeah, absolutely. I and mean, it's an absolute guarantee. It's, well, it's not a guarantee, but it's you're putting all of your best evidence out there. I would, you know, you know. If you want to find the identity of a person, I'd ask 400 questions. I mean, that's that's the beauty of this hundred number. This, you know, if you ask a hundred questions, you get every single answer possible, because the number of dimensions in that are far greater than anything in biology. Yeah. Uh, so, it's a real. It's humbling in the extreme to realize that we're close to having the capacity to. I mean. I mean, as I said before, I like to be provocative. And I give these talks where I say, look, if we understand the dimensionality of just 46 different receptors and we can come up with 10 different compounds that, 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 that control 10 different dimensions of signaling, we've got diseases cured or ameliorated to such a condition that you have them and don't suffer from them. And there are, you know, 80% of world deaths are caused by three diseases. It's really astonishingly simple. If we had, you know, like hypertension, we have it very, very well controlled because we have five or six different therapeutic interventions for that point. We need that for other things as well. We need that for cancer. We need that for cardiovascular disease. We need that for diabetes. We need that for dementia. That's perfectly reasonable. And it's like we have a process and we know how to get there. And it's like, why isn't everyone working on that? <laughs> <laughs> I think... This is all we need to do. It's like, you know, it's like putting solar panels in space and having a carbon nanotube to connect. That's all we need. Question is, I often tell that to students and say, dude, do we want unlimited power? I don't know if it'll be good. Unlimited green power sounds great, but blimey, the person that gets it will be like Thanos times a billion. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, no, 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 no. You don't want unlimited power. It's uh, working hard for things is part of the importance of uh, success. Success mm -hmm. without trying is a, a hollow success. And I think this is, you know, even though we do miraculous science and we can measure what would take a lifetime 20 or 30 years ago, it's still a mountain to climb because every, every peak that we reach, we realize that there's many, many, many more peaks to go. Uh, but 
question is, if you stop and look around, is your knowledge good enough to effect a heuristic solution to a disease or a condition? And quite often it is. And often we, in the big data field, we get too interested in collecting more and collecting more and collecting more and collecting more. Question is, are we at the point of actionable intervention? And we definitely are. And the work we're doing, this is why we're now branching out into creating our own startup. We are convinced that we can affect this capacity to just churn out potentially effective therapeutics for condition after condition after condition. Not because we're super smart, it's we've done the hard yards and we've looked at condition after condition at the intense molecular stratification level. And we can say what this disease is compared to that disease, not based on a single clinical parameter, but based on the analysis of thousands or hundreds of factors. And when you do that, your accuracy of prediction, your accuracy of efficacy gets to 98, 99%. And it's sort of like, okay, well, either we're convinced by our own work, and if you're not convinced by your own work, dude, well, then, what on earth are you doing? Stop it. <laughs> Stop there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and if you are convinced, then, as we said, with Pally Janssen's, patients are waiting. It's, yeah. it's, it's, I mean, it's sort of, there was quite a, a sort of uh, a sobering headline in the UK press the other day saying, oh, this is the first day since lockdown 2020 that... Cancer and dementia are now the biggest life takers in the UK now. It's beaten COVID. It's like, oh, so we're back to cancer and dementia. Great. Goodness. That's good news. And it's like, there's still, there are still clear and present dangers, as they say. There are still problems and there are still diseases. That, and we know many people, you know, we've seen many friends of ours and colleagues. That, and it's quite, it is always sobering as a scientist. And if you're working on a specific field, let's say you're working in oncology and someone that you know, is diagnosed with stage 3G, you know, subglioblastoma, you sort of know that that's it. It's, it's yeah. been 18 months, 20 months. You think, dude, that's really bad on me. Because even though we're not going to, you know, we're not going to turn around and cure cancer instantly, but we should be on that road and we should be, you know, developing and feeling confident about what we're doing. And millions of people are. It's just, you know, seeing that headline and thinking, oh, well, Success, we've got rid of COVID, but we're back to cancer and dementia. Yeah. And it's sort of, there are problems and we know we're not going to kill them. This is, the, this is the great thing that we've sort of, you know, I remember I used to work with a guy called David Price, who was uh, a urologist and said, either you die with prostate cancer or, or, or of prostate cancer. And we know we're not going to cure anything. We, we will all develop diseases. We are imperfect machines. We make bad waste products. We have damage. Question is, and can you die with these diseases? Can you die of old age and frailty with yeah. subclinical expression of these diseases? There's not a single, I mean, there's no standard healthy aged person. It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. Every, if you look deep enough, it's always a problem. So that's our goal. And I, it's actually sort of actionable. Uh, it's not crazy talk. And it's because, you know, like I mentioned before, Multidimensional answers to multidimensional problems. It's not just drug in the, it's not just drug X. It's drug X with this, with that, with lifestyle modification, with dietary modification, yep. with biofeedback, with alterations of periodicity of light or alterations of olfactory conditions. Or it's that's the it, you know, we often called, you know, in the UK we have this phrase joined up thinking. I, as you get older, you get smarter and you learn to think properly. And it's like, yeah, this is joined up science. It's, we, we really, you know, the, 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 the separation of disciplines and the separation of m mechanisms of intervention is being broken down. But now people would say, oh, doing mindfulness is good for you. Understanding about your quality of your mental health is an index of your biological health and attacking problems in every possible way together is the best solution. Yes. Um, I, I love, I love the idea of being able to acquire and analyze data to a point where you can actually pinpoint a series of events that are crucial in a specific disease 
or mm -hmm. in aging. I also love the idea, and, and it comes back to what we were talking about in the beginning, that doing that Western blot, yes, it's boring, but it has <laughs> a purpose. Yep. You can tell by now that I hate, I always hated Western blots. I think it's because I never I was able to do them properly. And trying to find a GPCR, I mean, separate oh. a GPCR and a blot is just... Absolutely. It's sort of like, uh, there are, you'll occasionally find people in your lab that are mystical, that have this capacity to just beautiful Westerns, and you go, oh. Oh, well, I'll keep you. You're really good. You're, do you're doing those for the publications. <laughs> you're condemned to do Western blots into the end of the world. Absolutely. It's such a, but it's such a, uh, a rite of passage in a way uh, uh, to get a good Western. It's, sort of, it's, it's a sort of, it's, a, it's an artistic skill, but yeah. But really we, we sort of, they're, they're sort of like historical quaintness. It's like talking about the PowerPoint with the blue background. Yeah. It's like, oh, you're doing a Western. Oh, that's quaint. That's sweet. You know, that's, that, that's quite fun. Oh, you're not measuring 5,000 things? Oh, that's okay. Exactly. But, it's, uh, but, it's, but, it, but I think knowing that with, with the tools and the knowledge and the perspective that you can have when it comes to big data, how mm -hmm. you can use it and putting that into the context of a disease, the context yep. of curing people or at least modulating their health in order to live as long as possible yep. with as little as, you know, little disease, little number mm -hmm. of disease or subclinical levels of some diseases. I think it's just that's that should be the goal of, of every scientist. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, that's when one thing that the world would be a better place. Yeah. Because that's one thing as a pharmacologist, that we're now sort of like flipping the textbook in a way. My goal as a pharmacologist now is to give drugs to people that aren't unwell. That would be a crazy concept many years ago. I mean, if you give insulin to a non-diabetic patient, it'll cause some real problems. But what we're trying to do is we're not trying to make remedial drugs. We're trying to make what we call uh, disease trajectory modifiers. It's a lousy phrase. We've got to come up with a better one than that. But you know, the presence of the disease is there at a totally sub and preclinical status. We can, you know, if you measure enough things, you have a pretty good predictive capacity. So all we're wanting to do is to prevent that from growing, identify that it's there and then prevent it from growing from a long-term point of view. So yes, technically we are giving drugs to what's called healthy people, but as we know, no one's healthy. From birth, you're beginning to generate the unhealthy yeah processes of late life and that's it it just depends do they grow to a point where it's a raging disease yeah. or are they unnoticeable and so in a way we are being much more proactive with respect to this because we know it's going to happen in the good old days it's like oh yes you eat this and do that and then you won't get a disease and that's it but we know now the reasons behind it so why not monitor those on a regular basis and this is starting to happen this is part of one of the good things with COVID-19 is that they're starting to develop wearables for monitoring virus load. We should have wearables for monitoring many other biofactors as well. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's uh, and that in a way could actually transform because the problem with a lot of therapeutics is, is that they're given to a person who is a complex system that is a long way out of balance. And the funny phrase is I often tell people, so your body is always checking itself. And cells are always checking themselves to see if they're okay and to see if they can get back to normal. The problem is, is if you have this long process of constantly changing and changing and changing and changing, your body gets used to it. And your body actually gets used to being ill. It gets used to being different after a while. If it's, a, if it's acquiring that state, it gets used to it. And the problem is that when it gets too used to it, it actually becomes resistant to the therapy. It doesn't want to go back to what it used to be because it doesn't think it's normal anymore. Exactly. It's got That's used the to the normal. new disease normal. Yeah. yeah. So it's actually better to prevent it getting there. And sure, the problem is, is there's no perfect state that we know of, but we do have a capacity to see what's bad. And if you can keep, if you, if it's hard to pick up a bad disease signature, then you're healthy. So health is absence of obvious disease signature. <laughs> Sounds boring. <laughs> it doesn't sound very exciting. Are you feeling healthy today? Oh, my disease signature is tiny. Don't you feel great? And it's like, that's the reality. That's the fascinating thing. Personally, I think it's great. And I'd love people to do it and have that concept. I wouldn't touch it with a 10 foot pole. <laughs> I'm one of those people that I'm not, but I don't want to know. I, I know, you know, that the things that I can do are going to help. I don't want to know how well, or not 
they're working. Other people might want that. It's like, you know, if you were told you'd know where and when you're going to die, would you want to know? Of course not. I wouldn't. No. I wouldn't go there. <laughs> no, definitely not. I, I wouldn't walk across that street. I wouldn't go on that holiday if I knew that was going to happen. So, yeah, it's sort of, I think it's an, it's an interesting choice to have, but I think we will be faced with that choice in the future. I think there are many people who have got this biomonitoring capacity and it's sort of, in a way, it's important. And it's an important concept in pharmacology because you're looking at amplification of effect. If your effect is lifelong, then the one of the biggest problems with pharmacology is dosing effect. And, you know, it's yeah. the classic, classic uh, sort of definition of pharmacology, Paracelsus, you know, every drug is a poison, every poison is a drug. It's true. That's absolutely true. But it's only true if you have to give lots and lots and lots of compound. But if your effect is amplified across a biological network, you just need to touch it ever so slightly. The drug effects from uh, a naturally amplified and synergistic process are enormous. And you're far less likely to resist that push because basically all you're doing is you're keeping your allostatic system happy. And that's all yeah. it needs to be, is that it just doesn't need to see that many perturbations. So it's sort of, in a way, that's my next pharmacological push is to sort of change the way we view pharmacology. It's not as a therapeutic, but a prophylactic in a way. And we all, you know, prevention is better than cure. How many times have we heard that? Cliche time, number one. That's, it's, but it's yep. so true. It is. It is. But Why? now we know how to do it. Which we is, which is amazing. Which is amazing. And, and why, if it, I was going to, so I speak multiple languages and now the next word would have come out is in French, which is effectivement, which is clearly, mm -hmm. if you can prevent it and you know how to prevent it and you know what to prevent mm -hmm. specifically, yep. then it saves you a lot of headache as well. Absolutely. Because you won't have to and go it, down a specific a road that may or may not lead to, to that organism dying. And it's sort, of, it's sort of like, you know, it's a bit in a way, you know, this, this concept of um, universal income that would free up people's lives to be more productive and be more creative, blah, blah, blah. This is the healthcare version of that. This is, oh, you're not going to have to suffer with healthcare problems, okay? You're probably going to be okay. And can you imagine? I mean, you know, let's not blow things up, but hey, let's be provocative, whatever. And this could be transforming of society. Imagine if we really don't have disease. And I know big companies that have this as their slogan, a world without disease. It's not crazy talk. I, I mean, I used to think it was crazy talk. It's not crazy talk. Big companies have this as their slogan, world without disease. I think it is attainable. Now, of course. I stopped myself saying, oh, in the next five years, blah, blah, blah. Because then, of course, I'll be shot down instantly. But it is attainable. It's attainable. It's like the sort of Gene Roddenberry view of the future in Star Trek where everyone's happy and everyone gets along and there's no problems and there's no wars. Yeah. It was a, it's a beautiful dream. But we have to dream. Because we, we all dearly want that to be the case. We dearly want, like, a Star Trek bridge of, like, George Takai and Nichelle Nichols and people i mean the groundbreaking and it was a dream of like oh this is the future uh, all this hatred and racism and bigotry it doesn't exist in the future we don't have money we don't have worries and that's it a future without disease is not crazy it is not crazy and it could be a renaissance a lot how many people do we know are cut down before their time because of disease yeah. how many creative people how many good people how many helpful yeah. people yeah. and it's sort of that's I mean, that's really transcendent. If, if we can be productive, be effective, and be healthy, and be mindful for longer periods of time. It's not, you know, this is the thing. It's like, you know, if you want to be fired up about what you do science-wise, dude, that's a goal. It is. I mean, <laughs> that's a goal. It's like, if that doesn't get, you know, it's like my favorite joke is sleep. It's what, you know, it's such great. It's the reason I get up in the morning. You know, it's sort of, uh, it's it, the goal in science. I mean, even though, I mean, good Lord, there are days when it's awful. But when you sit down and think, oh, wow, that's our goal. And sure, we'll be that much of it, but we're still part of it. And we're going in the right direction. You don't have to save millions of people. If you just be good or kind to one person or save one person, 
that's it. You're a good human. And it's sort of, yes. the thing we do is so noble. I mean, people give of themselves in science so much. And they do. The small, I mean, big people, small people, everyone is just as important. The person that's in the lab for a few weeks or months or days, if they're doing the right thing, they're up there with the big Nobel people. They're just as good. They're just as worthy humans that have done the right thing. And it's sort of, I never get old in telling people that. It's sort of, you know, it's sort of, yeah, it's Friday and getting deep and podcasty, but it's like, <laughs> dude, it's so important. It's, it's, you know, it's like, it goes back. Science is a human endeavor. And as I said, the meaning of life is to make the world a better place for other people. And that's it. And we just do it through science. And it's really important. And it's like, dude, imagine if we really can do this thing of eradicating disease. I mean, it sounds ridiculous. And it's like, you know, headline grabbing nonsense, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't sound ridiculous. I think it sounds grandiose. And I think it's, it's, a, noble, yeah. it's, an, it's, it's a noble cause. I mean, we're never going to do it. But why not dream? <laughs> exactly. exactly. Why not dream? If we don't dream, we don't get there. I mean, you know, you can go to the NASA website and you can see the beautiful pictures of what they call the Alcubierre drive. It's a warp drive. It's a faster than light drive. And they've got real pictures and real models and real things. Of course, we have to do it because we know that if you, even if you travel at the speed of light, 30,000 years to get out of the galaxy, we're not going to see any other things. We're not going to do intergalactic travel. We have to do these things. And without that tr imaginative ambitious, crazy drive, we wouldn't get anywhere. So you have to, you know, if your like attainment things is like, just do one more Western, it's like, dude, no, no, no. It's like, number one, it's, it's like when I was in the States, it was like, I was applying for my green card and you'd get the, you had to do it through EB1. And it's like, the, the list is ridiculous. So number one on the list is, do you have an equivalent of a Nobel prize or Nobel prize? <laughs> And it's like, okay, that's, that's a big ask, okay? But we should have big asks. I mean, it's like, you know, there are big questions in physics, you know, the grand unifying theory or the uh, plasma uh, donut reactors and stuff. Well, we need big biology. I mean, and the disease eradication, and there are big breakthroughs happening a lot. And the, in a way, the fight against COVID is a bit like a war. You know, the, 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 the development of technologies in wartime has, has driven us, uh, good or bad. But the technologies that we're seeing now with COVID and the understanding that we have, and I, and this, I saw this with SARS as well, there was a global effort. I think it's, uh, I think the drive and the interest in what's happening now for the last two years will last, will last for five or 10 years and will develop a lot more things. We're doing things here now that we'd have never thought we'd have done before because of what's happening with the push of technology in COVID-19. So it's sort of, I never thought I would be doing that, but we are doing that. And it's one of those, it wasn't an accident because everything we were doing was right from a point of view of the history of the science that we're doing. But yeah, sure. COVID-19 is an aging sort of metabolic condition. So we were of course positioned in that place because that's what we work on. So it's unsurprising. So, but I think that drive and um, that, because, you know, curing a worldwide pandemic and, well, not curing, but like developing vaccines in the short period of time, miraculous. It it, is. It's, so we can do these big things. And I think it's that excitement and it's that rush and that drive, which is the thing I need to convey to scientists and students and researchers all the time is it is always exciting. It may seem boring. It may seem esoteric, but we're doing biology. Biology is you in the audience. And it's like, it's so applicable. I mean, it's like, you know, discovering an exoplanet millions of light years away is like, dude, it's cool, but it doesn't have much of an effect on you. But, you know, but if we can help save and reduce disease on people, we maximize our chance of finding new geniuses or n new good people. And I think it's, uh, I think it's a wonderful cause. And, you know, we start off thinking, you know, we start our careers doing small stuff, and, you know, but uh, I, it, we should be dreamers. And I'm always a dreamer. And it's like every talk I do, I say, like, you know, I dreamt this up 
as a dream goal, and this is where we are. We, we, we will try and make our dream. We will make our goal a reality if we can. And we learn everything along the way. And I think it's sort of, I, you know, I've been doing science for many years now, and I should be tired and bored and jaded of it, but I'm not. Often when I'm not talking to somebody, I am bored and tired and jaded. But when I talk <laughs> and I realize, oh, wow, it's really exciting, isn't it? And it's like, it's, it's still there. It's just difficult when you're doing the same thing over and over and over again. Yes, and but then, that, then again, it depends on, on what's, what's that thing that you're doing over and over and over again. Yep. If, if, if it leads, if it's the same thing or the same technology, but for different purposes, it's, it can serve different purposes mm -hmm. and it can advance different fields. Yes, that boring part, you know, the cycling through the day can be boring, yep. but what keeps you going is that noble goal that you set. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I think that's 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 what happened with with COVID in developing yeah. so all of these vaccines in such a short period of time. Yes, there is a need for it, mm -hmm. and everyone in the world has been impacted by the pandemic. Yeah. And I wish we, I don't wish that we would have pandemics over, <laughs> and over and over again. But I would, what I would wish is that we could learn from this, yeah. this drive. We would learn mm -hmm. from this from this what happened in the past two years that we can actually come up with solutions pretty fast yeah well actually i mean we we are really experiencing that we have sort of made like a mental change and really sort of thought about adopting new strategies based mm -hmm. on what we've done now and as i said i think i think the the uh the the ripple effect of the impetus and the drive and the cognizance of health. And this is one thing that I, I've also, you know, felt very strongly with respect to COVID-19 as well, is that, you know, we should, we should start, you know, the, one of the big issues here is immune functionality and immune senescence and immune health. And we should think about active promotion of that. So we do exercise to increase muscle. We do Sudokus for our brain or crosswords or whatever. How about doing things for general immunological health? Uh, it is a, it's probably the most important functionality. And a lot of the work we've done on aging looks at immunosenescence and stuff. And it's sort of, it should be a normal part of life. We, you know, that, as I say, we will experience, there will always be new viruses, but we don't know what they're going to be. But you know what? If you have a strong immune system, it's pretty good. It's, it, it's, it's how yeah. we've got to where we are now. Okay. And the cognizance of that and the understanding of how we create it, I think is, I mean, it's interesting. It's like we talked before about um, gestational diabetes and this sort of, it's interesting that things that we take for granted that we see every day, we don't really understand. <laughs> it's, like, yes. where, it's like, why don't we know this? Why don't we know the mechanisms that cause this? And why don't we, it's, 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 in, it's sobering to realize that things that we take for granted don't really understand. It's like magnetism. That's my favorite one. What's magnetism? <laughs> Come on. Don't tell me it's magnetic force in Wikipedia because that's not good enough. My kids don't get that. It's like, okay. So dad, what's magnetism? It's a magnetic force. And that's it. <laughs> yeah. Or, or and, just even asking the question of how, how do you make magnets? Yeah. How do it's, you mag how, how does that even happen? Yeah, it's 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 one thing I I, I sort of uh, before I came to dad I think right okay when you know because the, the the worst thing you always see is like oh dad wants to do that oh I'm too busy don't know that and I set myself a challenge before being a parent of never doing that of never saying I'm not going to give you an answer or I'm not going to work it out or see it but to always and it might not be a good answer it's like duct tape it might not be the best solution but it's a good solution. <laughs> It's not bad. And it's sort of, there's always a solution to any problem. It's not insurmountable. And but the most important thing is to what actually is the problem? What actually is magnetism? What actually is diabetes? What actually is immune dysfunction? And a lot of the time, we've not actually asked that question because it's been difficult, because it's been complex. But we have the tech to do that now. We know what... You know, it's like with dementia or Alzheimer's, what actually is it? It's really still been a large mystery for a long period of time. And yet you see it. Everyone knows someone with dementia. And yet we went down one pathway for many years and it didn't become fruitful. And it's like that was because it was a low dimensionality process. But of course, the story I always tell is like, ah, 
well, actually, the most effective therapeutics are actually receptor-based ones long before the genetics of the disease were discovered anyway, and you still take Aricept. So it's still receptors at the end of the day. It's always receptors. <laughs> Obviously, it's, it's interesting. We were talking about, about COVID and uh, COVID and the vaccine, and I don't know if you've had your, your shot yet. But um, no, not yet. No. I did get my first uh, my first dose, and while I was oh. sitting in that chair, and the gentleman went, was going through, you know, potential uh, potential issues I might have, or, and I was thinking to myself that that second when the injection went into my arm, how much work and how much energy and how much R and D and testing mm-hmm. and and all those people who worked on it, how much it went into that millisecond when mm-hmm. when i got the shot and it's just mind-boggling mm-hmm. that we could be doing that for other diseases yeah we could be curing or at least limiting the effects of other diseases mm-hmm. in just that fraction of a second it's it's sort of like the the sort of neil armstrong's footprint on the moon it's like there's a lot of people <laughs> doing a lot of things for many years. It's yeah. like sort of the the, the sort yeah. of the culmination of like human endeavor. Yeah. I love the I love those those sort of those sort of moments. It's like you know I mentioned before that I'll often have a student and they'll be sitting down and say, "Do you know you're the first human on the planet that has ever seen this answer in front of you? No one's ever done this. No one's ever done this research, and no one's ever seen it. You." are Neil Armstrong. You are, uh, with the first eyes of any human that's ever existed, you have this knowledge. Yeah. It's just unbelievable. And it's every day. It's remarkable. I, I always, I, I'm always, I can always tell if someone's interested in science or not when they, when they realize that, they go, oh, that's cool. Dude, am yeah. I the first person ever? And it's like, we, I dreamed of, you know, I did actually dream of being an astronaut and, you know, I would still, if, you know, my wife will not let me, but if they said <laughs> he wants to go on the Mars mission, I'm going on the Mars mission. <laughs> I'll go. Don't worry. I'll go. It's, but just, as you say, for that, you know, moment of injection is, wow, this is yeah. us. This is humans doing a good, cool thing. And aren't we smart for a bunch of apes? I love that. <laughs> I mean, it's like, dude, it's like we are, and this, in, in, you know, it's like we discussed before about the the intellectual nature of discussion on podcasts and stuff is that, aren't we smart? And, you know, I often have, like, I, I often do talks to uh, sort of lay people and stuff and say, miracle in what you are that you are 37 trillion cells and in every single cell, there's about 42 million proteins and every 10 seconds, there's a million chemical reactions. And aren't you a wonder yeah. of magnificence? Yeah. And that's just happening every day and this is washing over you. Just stand back and appreciate exactly. what we are. And, and you don't even have to think about making your heart beat. You don't even have to mm-hmm. think about, you know, made, making your lungs take in the oxygen mm-hmm. and exhaling yep. CO2. It's just, it's just magnificent. It's all offline. And the, yep. the interesting thing is, is sure, it, if we even, I mean, we have unbelievable levels of detail of analysis and understanding of these things. But the wonderful thing is, no matter how good we get, still only 10%. There's still way more stuff in there that what we thought was complex is not. It's actually this, the tip of the tip of the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. And it's sort of, um, that's the thing that sort of keeps you coming back to the lab is that it's, you know, it's like, uh, it's like in the dark night when uh, the Joker, the wonderful Joker is explaining to, uh, I think it's uh, Two-Face and saying that I'm not like a dog chasing a car. I wouldn't know what to do with it if I caught the car. And that's it. And it's like we're dogs chasing cars. We're just chasing. We know we're not going to get there. But the difference between a dog chasing a car is that we can stop and say, ah, well, actually, we've done something really cool here. Let's appreciate it and let's implement it. But we're still going to chase the car the next day. And it's sort of, I love that dichotomy of like, yeah, you're doing something that's never going to stop and you're never going to get there. But on the way, you can still do magic. It's it's there's no other 
it, it, it's often hard for non-scientists to understand and appreciate how weird and funky science is. You go in every day and you do something different that no one's ever done before, and you expect to know where you're going and what it's for. And no one plans anything, and that's it. And it's sort of, for most other people that don't do a lifetime of research, they go, what sort of job is that? <laughs> Why are you doing it? <laughs> Why are like, you still studying? I think that's yeah. one of the questions that a lot of you know, PhD students or the families of PhD students or, or postdocs ask these people who work actually in a lab and tell them, why are you studying? What are you studying? What is there more to study? Mm -hmm. And I think there's it's, always more questions that we can ask ourselves and there's more questions that we can try and answer. It's sort of like, it's a bit like, it's a, it's a bit Schrodinger's cat-esque in a way that the, the study of the system not only changes the system, but actually increases the complexity of the system that you're studying. And that's the beauty of it. And it's sort of, the fact is it's always there. It's just that you don't, you know, it's like you don't need, you know, sort of new vistas, you just need new eyes. And that's it. It's sort of, you always, everything is there. Everything is there and always has been there. And if you sort of, if you start to get metaphysical on things, everything's existed and everything's already happened because time is like that. It's a roadmap. So technically the future has existed already. And it's like, you know, so when you get that crazy, then you think, oh, wow, okay, all we are doing is just wandering along a time map and that's it. But the in interesting thing is, is you learn things along the way. And it's, I think that's what separates somebody that wants to be a scientist is that, you know, I, as a kid, all I wanted to do was learn things. And when you're small, it was learning factoid type things like the, the largest tidal wave or this or that. But I loved learning things. And what I loved was telling people, oh, how much I'd learned. And it was sort of like a, a pleasing process in a way, but I actually enjoyed learning things and enjoyed accumulating knowledge. And then that transmutes into enjoying creating new knowledge which is what we do now and i love that because it's sort of it's saying that the things that you know are water droplets and the creativity that you can do is the ocean current that you can make out of those water droplets and it's like wow is and then you think wow actually well there's a part of my brain that's actually telling me that my creative thing is in, in, you know is my conscious thought but it's not and it's sort of you're always preordained to do that anyway and it's like dude, that's crazy. <laughs> it is. But we're living in that. We're living in that reality. We're living in this sort of infinite multiverse. And you think, blimey. <laughs> yep. That's intense. And it, I, I often have discussions with my little girl, Penny, like that, saying, well, you know, what do you think? You know, do you think the universe is going to go on forever or it's going to collapse? Or, and she said that it, if, you know, so we talk about black holes. So all that'll end up is one big black hole eating all the other black holes and and I'll say, but, but, she, but she'll say, but dad, what's outside the black hole? And I say, nothing. But what's nothing? I say, I don't know. Yeah. But this is reality. And it's sort of, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm often, it's, it's sort of, you know, clearly it's a, a personal thing. But I think that often the way science is presented is, as we mentioned before, it's sort of, it's partitioned. The bio, a bioscientist does bioscience, a physicist does physics. It's not like that. It never used to be. Leonardo wasn't just a, an artist. He was a scientist. And many other people are polymaths. And it's sort of, actually, we've restricted and cut down on creativity and also the ease of learning science. Because too early on, we triage kids, you know, your art, your sports, your science. And it's like, no, you're everything. Because exactly. science is everything. And it's sort of, you know, that, and we miss out on a lot. We miss out on a lot of inventiveness. We miss out on a lot of kids fall behind in certain subjects because it's not done in that sort of way. It's just all natural science. I think it's sort of, it's uh, an interesting way of teaching people that there is connections and, and that's the most fundamental thing in everything in bioscience and physics everything is connected and there's a, there's a pattern to everything um, there is but at the end of the day i think um i agree i think everything is interconnected and don't get me started on 
boxes, putting kids into different boxes. <laughs> that's that's just drives me crazy, because I as you I think we agree on the fact that uh, we are a lot of things. We're not only you, you're not only a scientist. You're also an artist. You mm -hmm. can you can be good at music as much as you can be good at math. But then Absolutely. there is a connection there at the mm -hmm. end of the day. Yeah. And I think one of the reasons maybe that why all of these disciplines have been divided into these boxes is because they're difficult and people sometimes just thinking about the fact that you're doing computational biology and you're doing wet lab experiments yeah. as well, it's, it's a difficult thing to connect together. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that you cannot do it. Yeah. And the other thing is that doesn't mean that you cannot do it with other people. Mm -hmm. Well, that's one thing that... Uh, the collaboration uh, is key when it comes to, yeah. to this. Because over many years, uh, I've reviewed lots and lots of grants for different places. And one of the things that we often you know, have problems with is the convergence between wet and dry. Because often people that do dry experimentation are computational biologists. They're computer people. People that do wet things are not computational biologists and they're not computer people. And we often say, oh, work together. And it's like, it's not like that because you have to grow together. That's the problem is that don't, don't partition people and then tell them at the end of the day, oh, go and work with that person, it'll be great. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. But if you grew them together and got them to take a similar path on the way through their educational journey, it would be like falling off a log. It'd be no problems at all. And it's sort of, it's, as, as I said before, joined up thinking is that we should, we know that good science is multidisciplinary, but we don't teach people in a multidisciplinary way. So when I was at school, you know, you had a science route, you had an arts route, you had a, a humanities route, and that was it. And it's like, you had to choose things that were synergistic and would fit in with the, uh, the planning and the schedules. And so you would naturally fall into that process. And I think it is at a loss for everything. So it's a loss for artists not to understand the beauty of science. It's a loss for scientists to not appreciate how effective, beautiful artistic presentation is of their work. And it's sort of, it's a, uh, you can see it with education tremendously. And, and it happens very early on, much earlier than, than people think. Because when you're a child, you don't get it. You don't understand why you're doing a certain thing and why your teacher's doing this or doing that. And I think it's sort of, it's a, it's a good thing that I look forward to as I get older. I would definitely be interested in teaching and bringing, you know, because I've done the difficult things of jumping from uh, both field and technique and background and history. I've seen a lot. It's a very difficult process. It's very mentally jarring, but it's a bit like you know, muscle confusion. It's effective exercise because <laughs> you don't get trapped in one mode of thinking. I haven't got trapped in one mode of technology. I haven't got trapped in one mode of biology. So I look at things with very different eyes to most people. And you often see uh, complete nuances that you would never seen there before. And I think it's really important for people to do that in a career, which, but it's unfortunately, it's sort of engineered out by this devotion yeah. to, you know, sort of, monotrack science uh but i think you know i i try and exist in this mode to maintain the diversity of the way science is done if we're all the same then i don't think it's going to be very effective and i think it's good to have mavericks on one side and you know subject focus on the other side but we should all be part of it and we should all realize that you know we need to grow as a multidisciplinary subject and not force ourselves into it at the back end where it's just not going to work because we've gone too far down a single route we don't uh, speak the same language anymore absolutely and i think that's absolutely that's one of the difficult things when you're a computational person and when you're you put a computational person and a wet lab person together they they may use the same words but in each world mm -hmm. the words words mean something completely different yep. and and you have to kind of learn to coexist mm -hmm. again in order for that relationship to be productive. Yeah. And it's sort of, it's sort of like expectations. It's like I've had this uh, in my field with moving into protein chemistry and mass spectrometry. There's a lot of people in that field are chemists and they're, you know, 
exact, precise scientists and say, well, you know, we're dealing with a dirty biological system here, you know, and we're not that bothered about <laughs> the, precise, the precision and, and the accuracy. We just want to sample, and that's it. And it's like, it's sort it of the, sense. yeah, it doesn't jive well with how chemists and physicists are taught because they're taught to be precise. And it's like, ah, nature ain't like that. And we don't have the tech to really measure those things. But it's sort of, um, I think it is changing. I think it is, and if there's, and, I mean, that's one thing that I've really learned from the world of computation and the world of, you know, mathematical thinking. And it's gone all the way back. I mean, remember when I started out, I got interested in receptive theory. It's always been there, but actually, and this is what I'm quite different from, but, but I think it's actually changing a lot. I think a lot of people now are starting to work on systems and receptor yes. systems and not my receptor. And that's why... I've been different along the way because I've worked on many different receptors and that's the way you understand the system. And there are a, 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 an unparalleled variety of receptor systems. I mean, it's just mind boggling, but there is method in the madness. There is, uh, there are roots and there are simplicities and there are patterns, but by drawing across all of those things is important in doing that. But then you have to do it across multiple types of discipline. You have to understand everything from, funky molecular interactions all the way up to how these receptors function at a systemic level. And all of those are different texts. And that's why I think the GPCR field is so fascinating. It is really the, the field that encompasses so much of science, virtually every aspect of science. It, it isn't limited. It's only limited by, as I say, by your imagination. It really is. And I think that's the special thing. It really is a, a wonderful sort of happenstance of events and researchers. You know, it's, it's, it, it is mystical. It really is. It's sort of, it's, it's the perfect storm of function, structure, importance, relevance, tractability. I and mean, I, I can't, I mean, I will go into debate with every single person on the planet that tells me that their molecule is, is more important. Uh, uh, you know, you cannot run out of relevance. It will never get old. It will never get dull. It will never be irrelevant. It's, it's amazing. And, and the truth is, the real truth is, everything else is like that. But the GPCR people are so intense and we've done so much and we've focused and we've it, 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 there aren't, I mean, we wrote a review on generic receptors many years ago, and we realized that we had compiled evidence of mutation of virtually every single amino acid in the receptor. Wow. And it's like, dude, that's a lot. But it's all tech. It's terrible. We, and it, we are a million miles ahead now, a million miles ahead. And yet, so even if you break it down in every single possibility, the dimensions are gargantuan. We don't know exactly how these things really work. So it's, it's, it's a, an indication of how far you still have to go when you have something that looks simple. You know, it's like a game of chess or game of Go. It's a limited number of players, but an infinite number of possibilities. And yet, you know, like we said before, along the way, you can do some amazing things with these things. First of all, by accident, by targeting things we didn't really know that they were there. And then by making drugs that we didn't know how they actually worked on them. Because we didn't know that they did be the rest in things and other things. Yeah. And it's sort of, it's the perfect, if you want to give somebody an example of a heuristic solution, it's a GPCR drug. Because we don't know how they work. We don't know how they work. No, I mean, you could take the best, 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 best knowledge by the best, best, best people on the planet. And it's still not complete. It's n and it'll never be complete. But blimey, they're effective. And it's yeah. sort of, it's, uh, you know, it's, if you want to do science, you do it for a reason. And, the, and here, as we said, tr treating disease is treating health. I mean, that's what these things are for. That's the noblest reason there is. So, dude, I, I often say, why is everyone else working on their things? Why not just all work on this <laughs> thing and we're, and we're done? I'm sure you can do, after we treat all the diseases, then sure, you can knock yourself out with your own channels. Knock yourself out. But at the end of the day, they're going to come in to a receptor anyway. It's sort of, it's... Somehow, some know, way. You will always yeah. be changing something in a receptor function. That is true. Absolutely. It's, it's sort of, yeah. And it's sort of, I don't 
it's a problem because like you know we are a huge field and it's sort of but it's it's fascinating honestly i still still get the time when i have to explain what it stands for to some people I think, really <laughs> you don't know what gbcr stands for oh my goodness so i did a talk recently at a bar and stuff so i had like you know today's talk has been brought to you by the letters g p C and R. <laughs> I did it because my daughter was in the audience, and you know, sort of, I, I put in as many TV jokes as possible. So it's sort of, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's. I every single person I ever talk to say, if you want to, you know, you will never be disappointed by me getting you interested in receptors because you will never f fail to succeed, find a place to work, find something more enjoyable, or if you're a really interested person in healthcare, find something that, that, that's more effective, that's tractable, and that in your lifetime, you might be really part of something that you can really appreciate. And it's, it's, it's a great thing for people to realize that, they, that, that even the small people like me and other people, that we can have an impact. It, it's sort of, it's very edifying. And it makes you realize that what you're doing is good and can last. It's, um, yeah. And it can contribute into the, the kind of the holy grail of, of knowledge about, yep. about receptors, about, you know, human, the human cells, the human body, mm -hmm. organs, the systems. And that's, that's kind of what brings it together. And the, and the breath, breadth and depth of the field is also amazing to me. Some people, you know, have their favorite receptor, but then some people yeah. who work on systems and then, but I this think is, uh, all we have to do, all we have to do is, is putting it together <laughs> and try to understand how those connections work. Mm -hmm. And this is the thing, it's like, you know, we often deal, I mean, I think current pharmacopoeia is based on 46 receptors, right? 800 somatic, 1200 nasal, whatever. Well, I don't know what they do. <laughs> I don't know what no. they do and what, and what on earth. And also, you know, what actually, you know, domain swapping, multiplization, orientation ptm we you know the, the the if the fun you know the functional proteome is millions 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 and millions of millions. and it's like and it's temporal and it's it's um it's i think i use in one of my sort of talks it's like uh, i think it's like steve wozniak saying that you know sort of biology is 500 years worth of good questions and i think it's <laughs> it's not even going to be that it's going to be an eternity of good questions and an eternity yeah I mean, within a single cell, you have more complexity than the number of atoms in the universe. And a single cell. And uh, just stuff. And that's it. And then you can see it, and you can play around with it, and it's, it's a single cell. And it's like, wow, that's dense. That's compact stuff. It is. Um, it is. And think about it. You need a microscope to look at that single cell, mm -hmm. and it's so complex. Yeah. It, I love it. I absolutely love it because it's sort of, it seems impossibly daunting and that's good. You always, you know, a good trainer in sports and stuff always pushes the bar higher than the athlete can do. You always need to keep that. And dude, the bar has been set beyond the end of the <laughs> current known universe. We're yeah. never going to get over the bar. But the beautiful thing is, is we keep trying. That's the exactly. thing. You don't have to win. You don't have to succeed. You just have to keep trying. And yeah, you have to, first of all, you have to acknowledge the bar, that it's, it's there yeah. somewhere. And then once you figure out where, which direction it might be, just, just go mm -hmm. for it. Just yeah, go for I, it. I think it's, I sort of, if I was, you know, I, I often go and talk at schools and stuff and I, I get so much feedback when you tell people that there's so much that is not known because a lot of the time people will say how much they do know it's better to say how much you don't know really because if you what you do know all you need to do is learn that and then, then you're done and you're fine how much we don't know you know it's like you know the unknown unknowns <laughs> as Donald <laughs> Rumsfeld used to say exactly. there are more unknown unknowns than we could ever imagine and it gives us unlimited scope uh, that's the remarkable thing. I mean, you know, if we have a pragmatic view of treating disease with understanding receptor dimensionality, it's like, okay, once we do that, then there's still an unlimited things. What on earth can we do? What on earth can we do? It's going to happen. And it's sort of, yeah, it's absolutely fascinating. I, 
I wonder where we're going to run out of interest in GPCRs. I so, don't think. I, I, I hope we, I hope we won't. <laughs> we won't ever. But then, how do you, as as a you know a young scientist who just gets into the field or gets mm -hmm. the wind of the field at all, how would you mm, let them? No, how would you guide them into you know asking these questions or at least figuring out which way to go? Because there's there's multiple ways you can go at as as a young scientist. That is, then it's. A, I mean, even though I've been in the science field for quite a while, I'm always itching for new questions and new places to go, and I'm not really sure all the time either. I think that's the first thing I would say is that I'll give you advice. But you've got to get advice from lots of people. At the end of the day, it's you that have to make that decision. But, so that's all fluffy hand waving stuff. But, cliche number two. What is that noise? That beeping? That? I, no, no, I keep on hearing a regular beeping that comes and goes. And I wonder if it's an instrument somewhere behind you. No, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably me clicking my pen. Either that or it's, hopefully it's not a ticking bomb or something but I, don't think <laughs> I hope it's too, not it's, it's just regular bad. beep beep oh. as it goes well oh i okay. was just wondering if there was an in instrument you know no i think i think we're safe for the time being. <laughs> okay but what else so we're talking about, was, yeah yeah it's it's better to regret something that you've done than something that you haven't done even if you make a decision to go down a route and a few years later it is not what you thought it was going to be or it's boring, or this, or that. But the amazing thing is, is if you try and work and expand what you know, the most tedious thing can be interesting. I mean, we work. Uh, we one of our data sets is one of you know, this is sort of uh, untapped data sets. I mean, there's so much in a big data set; it's horrifying. And there was one protein that I totally overlooked because its name was so boring. It's like, oh, I'm not going to work on an actin protein, am I? Oh, come on. <laughs> it's like you instantly go, keratin, actin. Pff. But, dude, it's super interesting. Once you delve into it. So, you know, I, I tell my kids, it's like, you know, uh, nothing's boring unless you try. Things, can, it, things are only boring to boring people. There's, so don't be a... No, you, you will have to make a decision. You will never know if it's the right decision. You will never know. Never know. You can make a decision with all the pros and cons weighed up. And you'll think, aha, that's the best decision. And it can turn out terrible. Or you can make a different decision and it could turn out fantastic. You're never going to be guaranteed. But what you can guarantee is how hard and how diligent you are in your application to that process. So even if you make a choice, if you make the best of it, and the, this is the thing about you know science, it's a method. It's a method, and that's it. It's not answers. It's not questions. It's a method of investigation, and that is you know that has been set in stone. Not the principle, you know, not the technicalities, but the principles have been set in stone, and that is be open, question, gather data. Once you gather data, analyze it in a fair and unbiased way, and then come to the, the best solution or the simplest solution for that question and then test it. And as a young scientist, it's like, I, you know, this is, I mean, we're here, this is GPCR world. Don't paint yourself into a corner. Don't give yourself limited scope. But if you come into this beautiful family of GPCRs, your scope is only limited by your imagination. So yeah. the worst case scenario is you will have an unlimited capacity to work on every disease that you can. There is no downside. There is no downside to it. So if you choose this route, it's only as boring or as tedious as you make it. It can be unlimited. So it's often, you know, it's impossible for even a mentor to give the right answer because it might not be the right answer two or three years out. But the right answer is to apply science in the best and unbiased and fair way that you can. And with excellence, I mean, even with the dullest data set, we can find beauty and importance and relevance and order. It's the same with research. Is that even if, you know, it's like we mentioned about, you know, Michael Berridge and calcium regulation, it might not float your boat, but if you do a good job, 
doesn't matter. It's a good job. And you go, oh, I appreciate the art. It's yeah. sort of, you know, that you might go to an art gallery and you might not like a certain artist, but you, if you go and look closely and look at the brushwork or the palette work, you go, oh, wow, they're technically very gifted. And that's the beauty of science is, you know, I do this, um, I give uh, uh, as part of one of my courses, uh, students proteins. I, 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 the whole point of the course is informatics and how everything is connected. So I just give them random proteins and say, how is this linked to aging? It doesn't matter which protein I give them. I just throw them out randomly and they have to take it and say, oh, I can use this. I can show that. I can do this. And I say, I yeah. can give you dullest of dull proteins on the planet and you take the effort and diligence and do a good job and it can be beautiful. So in a way, you, never, you can never go wrong with choosing a topic. So it, the important thing is to do something that you think is important. And that's uh, often a personal thing. It's like, you know, the moving to NIH was because of my, you know, wife's grandfather. That was important to her at the time. And don't be, you know, as long as you're flexible and adaptable and apply science, it doesn't matter what choice you make. What isn't fashionable now could be super fashionable in 10 years' time. Yes. Agreed. And it's sort of, it's, it, and with a system like this, it's never going to go out of fashion. You know, it's only as boring as you make it. You can take something as, as uninspiring as possible and make it fat. I mean, great example, great example. So at Hopkins, uh, you know, we had Sol Snyder spent half his career on Gap DH. It's like, dude, it's like you tell somebody, oh, I'm going to work on Gap DH. That's going to be fascinating. It's like, no, that's a housekeeper. It's like, no, it's not. It's really important. I was just going to say that it is not because people <laughs> use that as a control, as an expression control in Western mm -hmm. blots. And it turns out that it's, it's not as simple as you think. Exactly. Exactly. So that's the thing you can. So it's your quality. You can be handed the worst uh, deck of cards in life, but you can use it properly and try, or you can not. And that's the only advice I would give. You always make a decision. Always make a decision. And if it's a bad one, deal with it. But own the decision and make it and do what you can do with it. If someone chooses a bad project to do or comes up with a bad hypothesis, if they do it properly and they say, ah, this is junk and garbage, I made a terrible mistake, top marks. Yeah. But if they take something that's cool and interesting and do a bad job, poor marks. It doesn't, it's not the, 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 the quantity and the, of the things you produce. It's the quality, quality of the way you do it. And it's sort of, that's an important thing for, because often it's a big thing in science to work on things that are trendy or cool or this or that. If you end up working for someone that thinks that's important, you probably don't want to be working for them. You want to be working for somebody that thinks, wow, they're working on this boring protein, but cool, their work was beautifully done. And whatever they do, they will do beautifully. And I'm always a, I, I love sort of Japanese art design and stuff and the way that there is a beauty in simplicity. It's like the best thing I ever saw was like uh, flower arranging and this sort of Japanese master flower arranging says, ah, it's not the flowers. It's the space between the flowers. It's beautiful. Oh. It's like, dude, <laughs> that's deep. <laughs> it's like the space between the flowers is important. But it is. It's actually true. It's, and it's fascinating how we have a completely inverse relationship of how we see the beauty in things. I see the beauty in the, uh, the technique and the application. The nature of the material, it doesn't matter. It could be, it could be super cool like latrophilin or it could be incredibly anodyne like beta 2 but the quality that you do the work in that's the beauty and that's independent of topic or research or so you can choose something you know anything can be made beautiful and that's what i eternally love about science is that you can it's it's like lego lots of bricks you, unlimited beauty unlimited things you can make and create it's sort of you know just make a decision. Uh, yeah, Just, absolutely. Uh, you always have to make a decision. I, I, I never, I am, I, I prevaricate for like nanoseconds because I, it's not, you know, you know, you can spend your entire lifetime going, is this one or that one? No, no, no. I just do it 
and then I deal just, with it. Just do something, yeah. yeah. Yeah, just own it and say, I made that decision because of this. And as long as you have, as long as you can explain why you do it, then that's fine. Then if things don't turn out well, then you just deal with it and you do the best you can do. Yeah. You yeah. adapt, improvise and overcome. And at the it's, end of the day, even though you might make the wrong decision, I think you have to figure out what you've learned from that process. I think yeah. that also there's in a way there's no such thing as a wrong decision. There's just something that you maybe had to learn in order yeah. to, to make that, that mm -hmm. good decision. I think also you touched on an important thing there is that, you know, people often have, and especially young and ambitious and talented scientists, they often have, I was one once, <laughs> <laughs> often have very big dreams. And, you know, it's sort of often said that oh, if you try hard and apply, you can achieve anything that you want to do. It's not true. No, it's But not. But you can achieve something. And that's what I've really started to tell people in recent years because it's it's actually a bit of a cruel thing to tell somebody that they can achieve anything because they're not going to and virtually no one does virtually no one does it's not the average human experience but the average human experience is you should feel happy and uh fulfilled by achieving something don't think of ultimate success as not being a success it's a success yeah. and it's sort of i think often and it's a very obvious thing in science it tends to happen is that there's often you know wunderkinds and stuff and so many burn out and don't reach because they n never achieved the trajectory of success that they hoped and predicted for and i think often because everyone dreams of those successes that mentors and i and i do this now with with many students is that you know don't ex you know don't think that you're not a success by not achieving everything that you ever wanted to, to do is that because the likelihood that you were going to was very small so you didn't do anything wrong it's just there aren't that many people that are like that and we're all just as important as each other we're all part of this team of humanity and it's it's often because we're used to, i mean science is all about excellence and promotion and genius and blah 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 and blah 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 But it shouldn't be. It's a broad church. It's, you know, it, no profession is full of, you know, Leo Messi or LeBron James. Not everyone is wonderful. There's well, lots of people. If everyone would be wonderful or if, if everyone would, would, you know, have a, one or two Nobel Prizes under their yeah. belt, then it would lose its value. It would yeah. lose the hope as well. If everyone, exactly. if everyone succeeded, what was, what was the point of trying? And it's like your success is your success. And it's like with, you know, reading papers and trying to keep up with people. Don't, you know, cliche number three now. You don't need <laughs> to be better than other people. You just need to be better than the person you were yesterday. That's all you need to do. But just it's hard because you're, the, the education system, again, we're coming yeah. back to that, to the kids and, and to that box, tells you as a child and tells parents that in order to be successful, in order to be rich mm -hmm. and healthy and the best of the best, then you have to fit, you have this, this, um, this list that you have to tick off and you have to be all the time at your A game and you have to get yeah. the best grades and be the best of the best. But mm -hmm. that, that's not true. You cannot be at that 100% best version of yourself and then i think you just have to figure out what is important to you as a person or as a scientist and where you could go home and say well you know what i had a great day yep. and i did much better than yesterday Absolutely. and i'm hoping that tomorrow i'll be better than i was today yeah i mean i had that sort of today i got a i had a very sort of vexing morning some of the programs weren't working and that's like i managed to sort it out i managed to get through it and i was sort of i had this like you know mental confusion and then i sorted it out and it's okay and it's like it's just you know it's not the best you can do it's the best you can do on that day exactly. <laughs> and like exactly. so, as long as you accumulate it and as long as you keep trying to do the best you can on that day and also it's not you know you can never No human can do 100% of their top performance every single day. But you know what? You do the best you can. And it's, 
it is a, it, this one of the things about science that is a bit irksome in a way is that we we're sort of a team but we're sort of not a team i would you know that that the, the way a lot of science is set up and you know the classic the, the perfect crystallization of this is the paper first author last author the rest <laughs> inconsequential in the middle and it's like <laughs> But that and and that has an effect on both individuals and also collaboration because then if you collaborate, you're not going to be first or you're not going to be last. And it's sort of, you know, I you know my my stock phrase that I use. Oh, did you ever read that paper about the the NASA moon landing? It's like, well, because they just did it, okay, and they didn't write a paper about it. And it's sort of yeah. we it's it's sort of it's quite an an artifice in a way. Because it does disingenuous. I mean, sure. Even if somebody is a micro percentage more of a contributor than the other, then they go first or whatever. But it's not how it really happened, and it's sort of it's it's actually counterproductive in a way for true collaborative science. And this is why things like COVID nineteen and things like this, where we try and push that out of the way, is is quite an effective advancement process because we then realise that actually doing something might be more effective. Than having this sort of uh, arbitrary output indicator of the paper, yeah, and it's sort of I, uh, I hope we can get beyond that. I hope we can see that the end result, and this is this is get back to why I like pharmacology because it's all it 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 is it would be nothing without a product, nothing without a product. It's entirely entirely a product system. It's a form. It's pharmacology. It's not about theory. It's not about. It's it's like engineering. It's like if you don't build bridges, you know, it's paper. Okay, and it's it's sort of the whole science is about endpoint, and that's what's fascinating in a way is that it's always about endpoint. Always, there's always a question, even if you're doing fundamental stuff. There's like, okay, but where's it going? What's it going to do? Exactly. What's it going to produce? And, and and why are you looking at it? Where, and, where's, where's the use of it for it? Yeah, we should always ask that question. And that's one thing that I really learned at, that NIH taught me a lot was the, the real translational focus. It was really like, why? You know, we are doing this for the taxpayer. And this is, has to be. And we also had this at MRC as well. We had very strong and good government directives saying, okay, this is now a current healthcare need. You guys work on it, okay? It's like Apollo 13. It's like the guys need a scrubber. Here are the bits. Make it. And it's yeah. like there's, there is an impetus. There is a patient waiting. There is a need. And there will always be a need. And it's, you know, I feel fortunate in a way. Very fortunate. And it's, I experience the fortune of falling into a position where I end up working on something like receptor systems that is important for healthcare. But because I've always been there, I, I, you know, one could imagine that you would feel blasé about it, but I don't feel blasé about it because I think about what I do all the time, and both from a, a society and a personal point of view, but also from a scientific point of view, I don't differentiate my views on politics, my views on society, my views on healthcare, my views on science are interconnected; they're interwoven because. You know, if you have the ethos, as I said before, meaning of life is to make the world a better place for the people. It, you cannot dissociate what you do as a science from what you do as a person, and it's sort of it doesn't have to be. We don't have to be Gandhi or Martin Luther King. We can't all be them, but we just need to do the right thing. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. And I, I sort of had that sort of. Uh, moment in my sort of mid early 20s and stuff and it's sort of oh it's it is that simple isn't it it all you have to do is do things that help other people and you know i have that noble view of humanity and people and science and it's sort of i will you know if it hurts me or if it helps me i'll keep on doing it because that's the principle and you sort of stick with them and it's sort of i you know I'll just be lost in the, the mists of history and time, but I'll, I'll tell my kids that's what dad did. And that was what I think. And that's what we do. And 
you know, it won't die with, you know, me. It'll, because the things we've written, the things we've done, things we've said, people we talk to, this is what we're doing now. We're talking and we're yeah. trying to spread the message. Yes. And it's, it's a message that you can take or leave. That's fine. It's entirely up to you, but this is what I think. And what we're trying to do is help. And from a very fundamental point of view, that's what, you know, pharmacology and receptive biology is all about. It's nothing but help. And it's sort of, it's a fascinating thing. And it's such a funny thing that it's not a part of modern culture. So, you know, if you show someone a double helix, you go, oh, yeah, that's DNA, isn't it? It's, it's, it's embedded in the world now. It goes back to, you know, life story. Proteins, we don't do that. It's funny. And it's like, I, I sort of, you know, because Bob's written his book recently and stuff, and it's like saying, you should really do life story for GPCRs, for the discovery of GPCRs and what they mean to the world. Because it is, it's just as important, just as important. It's a phenomenal idea. I think it's a phenomenal it, idea. I mean, it's sort of, you know, friend, actually one of my students, they have like a uh, uh, receptor necklaces and stuff. And, you know. <laughs> I love it. There was uh, someone t- tweeted at some point that you could uh, actually buy a cookie cutters, GPCR cookie cutter. Really? Oh, yes. Dude, this, the uh, Etsy store closed in the meantime, but I've been trying to Google it and see where you can actually get a, a GPCR cookie cutter. And then I think uh, it was the receptor with the G protein complex as that is well. Sweet. I think it would be a, a really sweet thing. But you touched on on a couple of interesting and I think fundamental things. Um, as as you must know, and, and the audience also knows, I spent some time at Rockefeller University. And I also have, actually, not that I think we're talking about mugs. I do have a Rockefeller uh, Science University mug. <laughs> and it says science for the benefits of, benefit of humanity. And I think mm-hmm. that touched very much on, on what you were talking about. And the other point that you made is that you, there is an objective, there is something that drives you every day. And that is transcends pharmacology. It is expressed mm-hmm. through pharmacology, but it transcends it. It's helping humanity and making the world a better place. I mean, we, we all have a gift. Some of us are super gifted. Some of us are slightly gifted like me Ever so at slightly different gifted. things at different but, things i think we're yes. all super gifted at different things and Absolutely. you can't be super gifted at everything i think the trick is kind of figuring out what you're super gifted at mm-hmm. and what you can do better than than yep. the average things that you can do mm-hmm. and align that with what makes you happy mm-hmm. and then do you those two, do. and then mm-hmm. align them with a higher goal which is changing something in the world or you know making humans healthy or allowing humans mm-hmm. to live disease free for example yeah and it's sort of it's the use of that gift that's the important thing is it that is. A, per- a person with fantastic talent that doesn't use it is no better than a person with no mediocre talent. talent that really busts their ass and it's like it's the busting your ass that's important it's not how good you are it's it's your diligence and your dedication. And they're such important things for both cognitive health and also biological health is doing a good job and trying and feeling satisfied is just the best thing in the world. It's, and, and that's, that's why I sort of like the science that I do because we often we we are creating, we are, we are taking the mundane and making the beautiful. And in understanding the beauty of complex systems, we are realizing that there are many ways that we can enter and regulate biology of disease and biology of aging. Is that the 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 horrifying complexity is actually a a godsend. It's a it's it's a mechanism by which we can tackle this problem. The more complex it gets, the more tools we have to fight it. It's a wonderful scenario. It's really quite it's quite miraculous in a way and it's sort of quite fascinating to be part of it i never thought i would be i i I really had i'm one of those people that have never you know if you sat me down when i was very young and say what do you want to be it's like i don't know (laughs) i never really had a plan i mean it's i would say it's actually turning into quite a common thing it's like when i was young a lot of people were, were very focused and had a career path i think it's becoming less and less and less so now is that people don't really because there are because of opportunity when you have lots of opportunities you're not really sure what to pick 
And that's why I said before, just choose summer and just go with it and do good things. And it's sort of, I've been fortunate and I will always tell people, do this. You're never going to be upset. You're never going to run out of good stuff to do. And you're never going to not feel as though you're being a positive member of society. And as a scientist, it's really good. And we, you know, it's sort of, uh, it's incredibly important. I think there are, there are, the world is becoming, you know, I think, you know, doing a good job and feeling pride in your work is, is, is one of the most important reasons for work. And it sort of creates healthy, happy communities and societies. And uh, it's sort of, uh, it's a very important process. But I didn't plan this. I, I've just sort of happily fallen into it. But what I've tried to do at, at each step is to do the best I can in that, in that situation on that day. And I know I'm not going to reach the top or do this or do that. But when I finally take my last breath, I think, okay, I did the right thing. Well, that's okay. <laughs> it, it, was, it was pretty it's, good. <laughs> I think at the end exactly. of the day, it was, it was a pretty good, a pretty good decision or a pretty good yeah, series of decisions that made me, you know, sleep well at night. And yeah, I, did oh, I sleep, I sleep really well. Actually, uh, that's one thing I have, to, I have not, I have not a problem <laughs> with, but I don't sleep much. I'm one of these people that has, I mean, my wife's a total opposite. She needs like full, full eight hours. Me, I can, I can survive with three or four. It's wow. not too bad, but normally five or six, but it's, it's getting worse. When I was a young guy, I, I could really burn, you know, the candle at both ends, no problems. But now it's sort of, uh, but it's um, every day, every minute, every, uh, okay. So here's my total sad, geeky, dorky thing. Uh, I'm sure a lot of other people. And so I'm, I, I constantly stare at proteins all day and gene symbols and stuff. I see them everywhere. I see them <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> It's every car, every car tag plate. I go, oh, look, there's a protein. Oh, look, there's a protein everywhere. <laughs> or the worst thing on soccer on TV: if Barcelona were playing, uh, you know, Manchester City. It's Beta Arrestin versus mild cognitive impairment to me. <laughs> it's sort of everywhere, everywhere. There's a protein gene symbol, and it's uh, it's a bit lame, but there you go. <laughs> so you're you're if totally. The, if the ones aren't there, you're totally embracing. If the ones the... aren't there, then I make them. Of course. <laughs> As we were talking about, you know, being nerds and completely embracing it, and I think I think I think you've reached that level of being one hundred labeled that one hundred percent nerd and embracing it, because you're seeing those gene symbols everywhere, yeah. which is everywhere. Which it doesn't surprise me. I sometimes, you know, I look I look at um, you know car uh, plates as well, and it sometimes I'm like, <laughs> oh, hmm. Especially if it's something that I've, I'm thinking about receptors or I'm thinking about something specific and I see them everywhere. It's, it's a little bit like uh, when you buy your first car and mm -hmm. you at suddenly you realize that everyone else has the same car or the same color around you or, you know, being pregnant and then realizing that the whole world is pregnant yep. around you. <laughs> but it's something that you've never really noticed before because it wasn't your situation or at least you never mm -hmm. consciously noticed it. Yeah. I often, I often find that with uh, disease signatures and stuff. And it's, I've just had that fairly recently when I've been looking at data sets and go, oh, wow, that's that disease. I hadn't noticed that before. And I think, <laughs> wow, I'm really stupid, aren't I? I'm really stupid. But then I, I tell my students, it's a good thing that's stupid because I, I get to learn something new every day. It's, it's not bad, but it's sort of, it's often fascinating how, uh, you know, that unless you have time in a time, I am I, I am overwhelmed and swamped with projects and data and results and papers and blah, blah, blah. But what I have to do is I have to work in blocks, like three or four or five day blocks on a certain thing. I, and I get into it and I finally solve the problem and then make some progress. And then I have to jump out and do something else. Uh, but by doing that from time to time to time, I, I see these cryptic connections and I see, oh, I've seen that. And I've got one scratching in my head right now that I can't itch. I, I have seen uh, a, a taxin-related protein in two or three data sets. I know two of them, but I can't find the third one. And I can't find it on my computer. And it's mm. driving me crazy. And I'm thinking, oh, <laughs> spina cerebellar ataxia 3. It's involved in something, and I can't remember what it is. And it's there, and it's, like, driving me crazy. It's sort it's of... the worst thing. Uh, yeah, it's... I can't, I can't remember where I saw it. 
because uh, I've had to change my computer recently. So my hard drive is like sort of sitting quiescent underneath my uh, <laughs> desk and it's got magic in there and I can't find it. That's the worst but, thing. Uh, it's when, when you know where you, you know in what area you should be looking, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. it's there. You just cannot access that, that information, that memory. It, 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 it is fascinating. And it's obvious, it's one of those things where you think, Forget something. And I tell my kids, just walk back to the place where you thought about it. There will be a visual cue, which will give it to you. And that's it. Yeah. And I, I just need to see my old desktop. So I, yeah. my level of organization is put things on the desktop. And my desktop <laughs> is basically 200 desktops wide. So I, I just look for the newest thing. And my newest thing is the thing I was thinking about and I was working on. Because I can't possibly organize things in file structures. I just, everything has to be out in front of me and that's it. And then I can sort of, my favorite things are top of the pile. <laughs> the number of scientists that I know that live in offices that are basically just stacks of papers. And the yep. thing they're interested in is the top of the stack. A thing that they're bored with is at the bottom of the stack. And they know full well they're never going to look at the bottom of that stack ever unless it falls over. But you cannot throw away the stack. No. Never. No. <laughs> and whenever you do move office or something, you go through this paper and go, oh, damn, that's a really good idea. Why am I not doing that? And it's like a million and one really good ideas that you never work on. Yeah. It's, uh, but my, my hope is, is to actually wrap everything together eventually and like publish the most ridiculous paper that goes in, that encompasses everything that I've ever done. It would be fascinating. It and would be a very long the, paper, paper as well. It would be, uh, yeah. It'd be one Maybe of those it would be a book at the end exactly. of the day. Exactly. Exactly. One of those self-published books that's, uh, it's, uh, yeah, I'm, I, yeah, writing papers is bad enough. I've written, I wrote a paper last year, which is almost like a book chapter. And it's like, uh, I think I had over 700 citations in it, and it was just crazy. I thought, but that was my lockdown paper. That was sort of, that was, uh, I have, I've got months of work with just dealing with online meetings. And so I'll do something, but, um, yeah, uh, hopefully lockdown will be a thing over the past I, soon, I but sure it's, so. It's interesting. I really don't mind the online stuff that much now. I mm -hmm. do a lot of lecturing online and it's sort of, it's fascinating in a way. My students have actually been sort of quite complimentary about, and sort of, it's quite nice in a way that they get to listen and go back and watch the video or listen to the presentation. And I sort of, you know, the way I sort of present is, it's a bit like, you know, it's a bit like color commentary, you know, the, 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 the slides there, but you don't want to hear me read the slide and tell you what's on there because you can read it. You can read it. It's okay. I'm here to give you a bit of extra input and a bit of, and you can see now I'm waving and waving my hands and stuff. And like, you have to do that. You have to emote and stuff. And it's sort of, it will filter through into your voice and then come out the other end. And I think it's actually quite nice in a way, because what I do is I imagine I'm just talking to a single person like you and I sort of, and if there were times when I'm really tired when I was doing the lecture or, or I'd made a mistake, I'd say, oh, I know it's a bit crappy. I'm not feeling too well, blah, blah, blah. Just, just make it easy like that. And it's like, that's, I always tell people, do a presentation like you're making conversations to one person in the audience. And it's impossible when you do it with a good old fashioned audience, because then you're looking around or you're looking at the slides. Exactly. And you have to focus on not looking always at the same person. <laughs> so that's exactly. That's going to make them uncomfortable. And if you choose the wrong person and they're yawning or falling asleep, you're like, oh, no, 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 not that one. But yeah. online, it's actually, I like this because, you know, we're, we're you know, looking at each other. But if I just have my PowerPoint presentation, the worst thing is the first few minutes thinking, oh, I've got an hour and a half of this and I don't want to read it. And it's like, but once I get into it, it's not too bad. But it's sort of, uh, it's, I hope that it's not going to be the future of education in a way. I think it's, it's a good adjunct. It is a good adjunct. I do like it. And the students actually do like it as well. But I think that this really, you know, I think the, the flexibility and the spontaneity and the interactivity of real in-person teaching, I think is super important still. Uh, but I think, I think it's an excellent adjunct. I, I, and I think it's a way of expanding it and making it easier to digest um yeah. and also for certain people it might be easier it's easier for access you can do it from home if you have other things to do if you exactly. have problems with mobility you can do it things like that you can re-record things you can do things so it, it's 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 actually yeah. I, I do think it's been a good development in that respect 
But I think it's difficult, especially for students if they're at home or if they're not in the university in the environment or uh, the social aspect is really, it's gone in, in a large sense at a lot of colleges. It just depends on what sort of level they're at now. But. Yeah. I, I think I think it, it should be kind of a hybrid model. I love the idea that, you know, lectures can be recorded and then you can go back and forth and then listen to it again and then take notes. If you're a bad note taker like I I was as a student, then, you know, it's difficult. I Now that you were mentioning about recording, I used to record mm -hmm. lectures on a cassette. Oh, it was, I wow. had Yes, and I think I still have some of these. I've kept one or two of these. I have Michel Boutvier giving his uh, his lecture oh. on a cassette cool. because these I, I always felt like it was a good thing for me to go back and listen to it again. Mm -hmm. if I missed something or collecting right. notes from others, but having this tool, like going on Zoom and being able to record it, have it on YouTube and just having, being able to work at your own pace yep. is vital. I think that's really good as well because uh, it's, you know, I think the plurality of teaching and realizing that there are lots of different types of learners, even at yes. a college setting, I yes. think has been a very good way of exploiting this as well. It's interesting to mention, actually, uh, you know, I'll delve into my world of geekness here again. When I was young, when I was young, when I was at high school and we had exams coming up, I would actually record myself on good old fashioned cassette tape, reading my notes and my work. And I'd listen to it at night as I was falling asleep. Interesting. Uh, and that was when I was like 14 or 15. I, w I was... You know, I don't sleep much because I'm a terrible sleeper. It would I, I would have to beat myself into submission to fall asleep. I would only have a light on. I'd only have music. And even now, I can remember painfully the last time I went to sleep without listening to a podcast. Oh, my word. It was 2015 where I, and I was in San Diego visiting some friends. And I went over to have dinner with them. And they said, oh, yeah, you should just, you know, s stay the night tonight. But I didn't have my iPod. Oh, and I, I basically didn't sleep. I didn't sleep. I had to stay <laughs> over there. But it's like, oh my God, I can't. I've got nothing to listen to. And I'm just sitting there and it's dark and it's silent and I couldn't take it. I'm one of those people that need to be beaten over the head to fall asleep. And uh, unfortunately, two of my daughters are like that. They need the light on, they need music, they need to read and they need to play with the dinosaurs. And I think there's a definite um, stimulation trait in there. Maybe, my, maybe, my, maybe. My wife is the total opposite. She loves silence and totally loves silence. But me, it's uh, constant noise. It would drive noise. me nuts. I think really? it would drive me nuts. If I, if I had to sleep in total silence, it would just drive me nuts because I would yeah. hear all sorts of noises. Absolutely. But I always have some background noise. Mm -hmm. And I've explored also uh, some hypnosis tapes. And I also oh. have, I also have, a, have a, a dear friend, a psychologist, who um, put together what he calls hypnoperforal processing and it's wow. actually uh, a series of at the time i think they were cassettes that's how old these things are <laughs> <laughs> but uh they all have their purpose and the whole idea is to actually listen you have for example you want to reduce anxiety right and the whole idea is to listen with both uh earplug the he headphones mm -hmm. and you listen at two different stories that run in parallel really Yes. And the message to decrease your anxiety or, you know, to help you sleep or whatever comes from both stories. And it's actually the, the, um, the words that would influence your brain come from the combination of both. Interesting. And it's really interesting because you're supposed to, you know, listen to it before you go to sleep or, you know, to take 30 minutes and listen to it. But what I've noticed is that I, as as you were mentioning, you work in blocks. I listen to this in blocks. Mm -hmm. There are times uh -huh. when I can listen to it for eight hours while I'm sleeping. And in the morning I wake up, I'm like, what is this noise in my head? And then not mm -hmm. need it for, for a longer period of time. But this is just really fast. It's like my brain always needs that stimulation. It needs to keep busy even while I'm sleeping. <laughs> Yeah, it's sort of, I'm one of those people that can actually work in Starbucks. <laughs> that I, that I, I do too. To focus, my brain needs to say, everyone else be quiet now. So part of it is saying, fight off the background noise, and then I can concentrate. If there's nothing, yeah. to co if there's nothing for me to concentrate against, it doesn't work. Yeah. And 
it's I would say the, the the sort of the strive for creativity and striving for the the genius moment is all I do all day is try and work for that purple patch of inspiration. I try everything under the sun. I vary music, podcasts, radio, everything. I I have spent my entire career searching for that mechanism of inspiration. And it's sort of, it's an eternally changing process and it varies from day to day. And it is effective and sort of, it's one of those things, it's like creativity. I think you can work at it. You, I mean, you have your limits, but you can still work at it. I mean, not yeah. everyone is going to be a Vermeer painter, but you can improve how well you paint, you know, and you can improve how well you are creative and how well you can work and how well you can mentor or how well you can teach. Yeah. I'm always a, I think, you know, that's the sort of the ethos of like training young scientists. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how far you're going to get. It matters how much you can improve yourself. Exactly. That's all you need to do. You, how far you're going to get is a lot of luck. It's a lot of luck being right place, right time, right things. And right people as well. Yeah, absolutely. So. But it's like, whatever your situation is, you can make it better. And it doesn't have to be the best, 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 best that you can do. Just a little bit better. <laughs> yeah, I think it has to be just good enough. Yeah. Good enough. Like, it, like this podcast, when I started it last year, and it's kind of thanks to COVID <laughs> as well, where I told myself, you know, let's just try it. And as a scientist, you always strive to do some th things perfectly, which mm -hmm. will never happen because there's always something that goes wrong. And I think you get to a point where you become better at things if you just mm -hmm. give it a chance. You just try it and you make mistakes and then you learn from them. Yeah. And, and even, even in something that you think superficially is not very good, you can often find little scintillas of genius or magic in there that the whole thing might not be... It's like if I give a talk or something, I'm very critical on how I think it went. But as long as I felt it was okay, it was, no, it's fine. If it was a total disaster, then it'd be bad. And yeah. occasionally I do have that. Other days, it's just varying degrees of, yeah, it's pretty good. And there are some days when you knock it out of the park and it's just everything goes perfectly. Yeah. And you can never recreate that. It just happens. It's exactly. A, it's a, yeah. it's but a, you live for those days. You live yeah. for those days. That's, that's what makes you want to try again. Yeah. It's always, always worth trying because, you know, it's often the best presentations that I've done or the best papers that I've written have been in, in times of adversity or times when I didn't think I was doing very well. And when you look back in retrospect, you actually realize that they were actually very good because of the adversity, because either you weren't, I, the, the best talk I ever did once, I was feeling really sick. I had to sit down and do it. But because I was, you know, sitting down, I felt really comfortable. And it was okay. Yeah. And I actually, it was a very difficult topic and I actually did yeah. a nice job. Uh, totally unpredictable. Yeah. And that's one thing in science that I like as well. And one of our big breakthroughs once many years ago was a total, I mean, it, it wasn't an accident. We did the experiments to do something. It's just the fact that the results we got were 100% opposite of what we expected. And that's good in science because it's, it's boring if everything is exactly what you expect. That's and the beauty getting of it. The, yeah. And I told my postdocs, like, dude, you've, you've put the labels on wrong. Come on, this is totally wrong. This is totally wrong. This doesn't happen. We did it three times more. We, it took us another four or five months. And it was right every single time. And we got someone else to do the counting and someone else to look at the data. And it was 100% right. And it's like, it was just wonderful to, to, yeah. to see that with all your best intentions, based on all existing knowledge, the funky things can still happen. And it's sort of, uh, you just have to believe in what you do and do the right thing. Whatever you get is good. There's no wrong data. It's just bad data. Or good wrong data interpretation is, of the data exactly. as well. Exactly. But that's the thing about, this. What, that's what I like about mass data, is that it's, it's virtually, it, it's a lot less fraught with respect to opinion of analysis, because analysis is always done by a machine at some point. It's very difficult to have a, a, an impartial view on something so big and so complex. Yeah. But the machine algorithm might be bad, and often a lot of them are. Um, I, I often teach how sort of uninformative some pathways really are. But it is what it is. It's like informatics is not a answer generator. It's a difference engine. It tells you, put two samples in, 
use the same algorithm, get different results, it means that there's something different in the samples. What it's telling you is not what's really happening, it's just a difference process. It's saying it's more this or more that, and that's it. Yep. And people get very disappointed when I tell them that. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, but that's the way it is. <laughs> it's, like, it's okay. It's not the answer you want, but it's the answer you get. We never yeah. get the answer we want. And that's the nice thing in science is I, I in just recently, we have experiments and a totally novel finding has come out. Totally, I mean, it's not because I'm smart or anything like that. It's just that it's there. And you, there's no one that's going to tell you that that was going to be, that this, you know, knockout mouse was going to show you this result. This is just totally with zero precedent. And it's, it's one of my real free songs uh, of sort of, of enjoyment in a way. So you have a protein and a condition and you go, oh, I wonder if anyone else has done that. Ding, 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 PubMed. Zero hits. Dude, yep. Yep. this is a thing. It's like, it's, it, I'm so uh, au fait with doing these things now. I often, ha I often describe data and results in, based on the number of PubMed hits on it. So <laughs> zero is like a unicorn. It's like, wow. It's like, I often teach this, uh, I think called a Google whack back in the good old days of early Google was to two, choose two words that you would put in a search and only get one result. And they're getting rarer and rarer and rarer and rarer and harder and harder and harder because there's so much connectivity. And I, I sort of use this to indicate how complex protein interactions are. But, but uh, so two terms and getting zero result in PubMed is like, it's like, wow, that's cool. That's awesome. 100, uh, you, it's okay, but it's getting boring. 10 to 15 is getting good because it's still really exciting, but someone else has done some work, so it helps you out a little bit. Zero is like, dude, we have no idea and we don't know what to do. But when you do it, you go, wow, this is a novel thing. And it's sort of, it's like, you know, seeing the data set for the first time. And it's like, wow, this is a discovery. This is a discovery. And yes. it's not me hypothesizing. It's like, we've done the work. Something's in there and something's come out and it's totally novel. And it's like, and wow. it's, a, it's not something you expected as well. So I think that what makes it you know, more valuable when it comes to mm -hmm. defining what discovery is. And I really sort of like it. I like it in this way because it's not my prejudice on the way in. It's just come out. I didn't want it. I didn't expect it to be there. And I, and, but when you go, oh, okay, that's it. Then you get to understand how important your learning and your background and your training is because then you can actually say, well, actually, if I think about this and this and this and this and this, it makes perfect sense. And then it becomes obvious. And you think, why didn't I see that? <laughs> and then you think, wow, knowledge is really good, isn't it? Because when you're presented with a seemingly random and unexpected result, you then go, oh, well, okay, you can actually backtrack and work out why it wasn't crazy and random and unexpected but only yeah. if somebody presents you with that first spark you wouldn't have never made that connection I mean, there are billions of connections that you could possibly make between protein and disease but you have to have that first result and that's what we do our science just can generate those results and then you do the common or garden molecular yeah. connectivity and stuff and you realize oh yeah of course makes sense and then you go why didn't yeah. I think about it before? <laughs> Absolutely. I, and that is, it's such an interesting way of doing discovery science. And a lot of people are doing it. A lot of companies are doing it. A lot of research labs are doing it. And it's sort of, it's very edifying because what it tells you is that even with totally novel discoveries, it's out there. It's out there in the ether. All of these things, all of these answers are out there. It's just, can you find, can you get the mystical data set, which, which points you the way? It's exactly. fascinating. Exactly. It's fascinating. I wanted to ask you something else. You were a little bit kind of in parallel. So we know that you have a totally separate, different approach than I'd say the typical academic to, to science and questions. And mm -hmm. we were talking about having, making decisions and, and balancing yeah. things. And I don't like this term, but I'm still going to use it. How do <laughs> you balance work and life? But I think it's oh. one and it, it's this to me, it's the same thing. You are the same person in your office, in the lab, mm -hmm. as you are the same person when you go home. Yes. But still, there is that balancing between science mm -hmm. that you do on a regular basis 
and also your your family life i think this is it's a big question that everybody everyone asks and it's it's a tough one but mo the more tricks the more examples you can give us mm -hmm. the better i think the audience can benefit from i think uh, i often used to use uh, I often used to use this as a sort of like a trick question for students, especially for PhD students. I, I would ask them their opinion of what they think with respect to your future studies. If you're being a PhD student, what's your opinion on with respect to, to work-life balance? And they'd say, oh, it's good to have a balance and blah, blah, blah. I'd say, no, it's not. It's your PhD, you're going to completely devote yourself to it and you're going to be locked in it forever and ever and ever. And it's sort of, it's sort of a little bit true. And the, the, it's sort of like a glib thing, but it's there to get them to understand that you, that it, that for a few years, it's a devotion. It's a devotion. And that's why it's relatively young. Because you often don't have the distractions unless you have kids earlier, stuff like that. But it, it, there is, and this is a, an eternal, and, a, and being a, a dad now uh, with relatively young kiddies, it is incredibly difficult to dissect. I mean, just, just before coming to the podcast, I just made sure that I had about 20 minutes of soccer time with my little boy because it's beautiful weather. And, it, and I told him it's just a, such a cherishable moment. And these cherishable moments are immensely important because even though you're very young, you don't realize that you do remember them and they do form a warm and fuzzy memory that will last with you forever, but you won't understand how it will last with you forever. And that's, you know, so that's a, a simple answer in a way is, it's not quantity, it's, it's quality all the time. But if you are, so often, you know, last year was a point in fact of the lockdown and then homeschooling. So all our kids were homeschooled virtually all last year. So it was a big push. But what we did was we taught all day and then when the kids go to bed at seven, we go upstairs and we go on the computer and we work until we run out of energy up to midnight. And that's a sacrifice. And so it's, it's well, the simple answer is it's a, a lot easier for men. And this is a problem in science, a huge problem in science, a huge problem. My wife is a female scientist and there is just not good enough flexibility. And it's a problem that the majority of scientists still, still at high end level are men. And the society and the culture of science is a male society. And the, the world of grants and the world of papers is aggressive and dominating and macho. And you know, I, I had this discussion once with a group of scientists uh, uh, quite a few years ago is that culture often is this is not accustomed or or amenable or interesting for female scientists who you know you know we can go back to the agreeableness that Jordan Peterson often talks about women are more agreeable and this often doesn't work in a scientific yeah. situation where it's like dominance and fist banging and I'm great and wonderful and blah 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 that culture's got to change because I don't think it's an effective culture either because it misses out on people and it's sort of it's, I think, you know, you know, the work-life balance, honestly, it's every single female scientist out there say, why are you asking a man? He doesn't know what work-life balance <laughs> And it's true. It's absolutely true. Absolutely true. The, so many female scientists drop out from kids and it, it shouldn't be that case. And it's the same. And, and also, if you're a good dad, and I try and be a good dad as much as I can, uh, it's but both of us, both males and females, once you have children, and this is the one of the biggest breaks of you know work-life balance i mean when i was single and didn't have kids dude i slept in the lab i lived in the lab. it was just normal but when you grow up and get older and da da da, and this is good to have children and i tell all my students i want you to have children i want you to have good families i want you to produce new good people that are good scientists so go and do that and i tell them that please feel free honestly yeah, i want you to do that because we need good people uh but it's it's part of the culture of, you know, this sort of personal driving and striving for excellence. It's a little toxic at times. And it's, uh, I think the consensual work would be a way to get around it to less pressure on individual success and individual glory and more about collective and the publication thing is a, is a huge thing in that respect. If it was just group X, 
then it would be fine. Then there would be a, a concept that no one has to dominate. And this dominating concept is a very, you know, it's a masculine tendency. And it's not that women can't do it. It's just that they often have better manners. <laughs> they don't see it as that, oh, yeah, you know, this, this concept of alpha male and blah, blah, blah. Women don't, they, they, they can do that perfectly well. Women are just as strong as men and just as dominating as men. It's just that they're often, as I say, more agreeable and they are interested in um, sort of not pissing people off. Too many men think it's okay to piss people off. I don't. I think it's, I think it's counterproductive. I think people need to be working in a way that's effective for them. So how I deal with it, especially with people that work for me, is I tell them, I don't care how or when you do the work. I'm only interested in the work getting done. You can do any hours, any time, any day, any way. You can go and do this, you can go and do that. Uh, and it's like, the interesting thing is, is if you are, you know, if quite often I will have to leave and go and pick up the kids or go and do something or one of them falls over and stuff. If I do that, they can do that. That's perfectly fine. And there's lo it's the flexibility. This is, the, you know, it's like with a lot of things in our world, Humans are unhealthy because we force ourselves to work all day and all night, nine to five and blah, blah, blah. We don't have natural cycles. It's not flexible. It's not very smart. It's, it's a model that's been made, like ha having the Kodak camera. Everyone's picture looks the same. Everyone is not a nine to five. Everyone doesn't work all the time. And also everyone, it's, it's sort of like this. And, and as I said, with the sort of concept of a glib idea of like totally devoting yourself to it, I think that is okay but we all know it's not practically possible. I think, I think having that as a concept is fine, but like trying your best on the day, you do your best with what you can for the time being. And I think what's important to tell people is, sure, I absolutely 100% guarantee that your productivity from a point of view of work will go down. But what you will learn, and definitely as a parent, is... And especially if you're a mentor or a guide or an instructor, my word, there's no greater learning experience than dealing with childcare. And the, the, what you learn about dealing with children is immeasurably important with respect to being a manager and being a leader or yep. being a mentor. I have grown inordinately by being a parent and thinking about my children and how to deal with them because they're in a situation where, you know, they can't respond, they can't talk back, and they can't tell you what the problem is, and they don't, can't deal with their emotions. And so you have to be observant and caring and patient. Those things are enormously beneficial. And I think that the old-fashioned model of, you know, man and stuff, where he hasn't done that, he hasn't spent time with the children, he hasn't taken time to uh, interact with them in a way... I think that's what's contributed to the the sort of the poor behavior and the lack of empathy and the lack of understanding. I mean, I yeah. every sing, every it's single time that someone asks for a day, I mean, I'm I'm astonished and shocked when people have to ask me, oh, can I take the afternoon off? Oh, can I do this? And it's like, dude, you know me. It's like, of course you can. It's not even a question. I was never any concept of, oh, you have to do this. I mean... Do people really say that? I guess they do. That's the scary thing. I guess they do. It's like, dude. And it's like when we once had um, a training period and it was on, it, it, it was for one of our, our mass spectrometers at NIH and it happened to fall on like a federal holiday. So I said, oh, dude, we can't reschedule. So I just bought like two crates of beer for everyone and pizza and said, I'm sorry, I have to do this. Like he can't change. We've got to come in, but yeah. we'll make it easy and you can take the next day off or whatever. It's just that flexibility. And it's like, you know, it's, it's sort of because I'm still relatively new and sort of as a, as a mentor and a leader, if you haven't done the bench work, then you don't understand what it is to tell someone, Oh, you've got to do this again. I've got to do it, you know, four or five more times. And if you haven't been, I, uh, I can't, I can't say enough how important parenting is. And, and, and it's not the act of parenting. It's the responsibility and the process of going through it and the understanding that you're responsible, that think, you're totally responsible. That's the point. It's, it's the fact that as a mentor, you are responsible for other people's careers. Yep. You are responsible for other people's well-being in the long run. 
mm-hmm. and you are the person they will look up to for help, for advice, and you can make or break somebody's career. And sometimes yeah. it's independent of how hard they work. Yeah. It just, these things happen. And it's like, uh, I've had numerous times where something as bad has happened. Something has gone wrong. And I, and the worst thing I'll do is I'll sit down and I'll think, I'll get them in there and say, and I might sit there for a minute and go, okay, right, let's fix it. I don't care what happened. I don't care who did it. Let's fix the problem and let's get back on track and that's it. I'm not going to hold a grudge or whatever, or it's like, as long as I am happy that you've told me that you've messed up, that's fine. Okay. Cause if you hadn't told me that's worse and it's, yeah. you know, I, I think mentoring is, I, you know, doing it without being a parent, I think must be very hard because being, and it's sort of quite fortunate in a way having younger children, because, you know, you do have to be super patient and you do have to be very considerate and very empathic. And it's not easy when you have a concept of a product that has to be done and whatever. But the important thing is to realize that they're just like you and they, you're just an older version of them that you, that yep. you don't, just because you've transcended student to mentor <laughs> doesn't mean you're a different person. I never think that. I always know, understand what the person is. And I tell them that, oh, I'm sorry, but we have to do it three or four more times. And that's, I know it sucks and it's boring, but we have to do it because we have to do it. Otherwise, we, we can't move on. And I feel you. And you, and you touched it. on an important thing is that at some point you were in these trainees shoes. And yeah. I think that's something that a lot of mentors just forget. Yeah. I, and I don't, I don't understand that at all because it's. I don't of, either. I don't either. Maybe, well, I, I'm nowhere. I, I don't have a, a, a group. I don't, I don't, I'm not, I'm a scientist mm-hmm. by heart. I don't yeah. work in a lab anymore, but as, when you you should never forget where you where you came from you should never forget that yeah. you made those mistakes you, who didn't make i don't know a, a an agarose gel with water instead of buffer or oh. who you know and and i think that that's what makes you a good mentor not forgetting where where you came where you started i think it's sort of like it's uh, i think I, i can't remember whether but yeah the word responsibility is everything it's like i think it was a a lousy movie I saw once and it's like being a leader is not about being the best. It's about taking responsibility. And yeah. I, all, and you know, if there's a problem at the bottom, it's because there's a problem at the top. The, so yes. when something goes wrong, whatever the student or the person or the trainee did, it's my fault because I wasn't on top of it. Yeah. And that's why I, that, you know, if I'm going to shout at someone, I'll shout at myself, but there's no point. I, people would think I'm crazy. So all I can do is go, Ugh. Not again. Yeah. And that's about it. But to me, it's always, always, always fix the problem. And that's what, you know, I've told that to my boy Linus many times. It's like, you know, don't cry about it. Let's fix the problem. Because we've watched Apollo 13 way too many times. Just fix the problem. <laughs> and that's it. There's, the work, I tell my kids, that's all I do at work. All I do is troubleshoot. All I do is fix problems. All I do. Yeah. This isn't working. That hasn't done this. That's all I do. Uh, yeah. All you do is fix problems. And people are happy when there aren't problems occurring in the lab. And that's the most important thing is to make people happy. And I, it's sort of, and happy is productivity. If they're happy in what they do and I'm happy with them. And that's why, you know, I do sort of rigorous interviews and stuff. I want, I want you to want to work with me. I don't want you to not want to work because then don't bother. because then it's just going to be a personality clash and blah, blah, blah. You want to work here. And I want you to work here. And it's a, it's a mentor and a student relationship is, I always dreamed of like this sort of like, you know, you know, sort of Padawan and, you know, <laughs> the, the, the master and stuff. And it, that's the way it should be. It should be an apprentice. You know, you really should yep. be. And I've had that from many good mentors and I really, I've had, you know, many great students and I have, you know, wonderful students now. Uh, but the, I never expect them to do anything I won't do myself. And if we need, if we need to work late, then we work late. And if, and if we're done, then dude, you can go. It's not even vaguely a problem. Mm. And as you say, it's, it's the, it's part of the ethos of, of being a scientist as a person. 
and not being a robot is that we are we do get bored we do get tired we do get jaded if somebody does have a bad episode if someone does flip out or or something that's okay yep. you're not a robot and you're, you're coming not a back robot. next day you're coming back the next day yeah. i'll never forget there was this one day as a phd student i was doing a, a facts of flow cytometry staining and it was it was a Friday, and I, I was like, you know what, I'm I'm done, and I've never done that before. <laughs> and that was the moment where I told myself, you know what, samples in the trash. It's three o'clock. I'm out of here. And came back on Monday mm -hmm. and did it again, and it was just great. The world is not going to crumble if on yeah. that day you're not feeling well, yeah. or there are things that you have to just you know think well about how you're doing them and then be in that state of mind as well to do them yeah because if if you're if you're forcing yourself to do it you're not going to do a good job it's as yes. simple as that exactly. so you have to know when to call it quits and i i get that you know most nights when i'm working upstairs on the computer it's like you know when i start to fall asleep on the microscope then yeah it's time to call it quits. It's I've it's, done that quite a few times. <laughs> Eyes it's in the sign. socket. Yeah, it's, a it's sign. not good. It's a but sign. it's. Uh, but I I feel deeply that there is. I mean, there is such a such a palpable paucity of female scientists in top positions. It's 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 not even vaguely a question. And this thing has to be gotten over either through good on-site healthcare or childcare or changing the science, the culture of science in yes. itself to make it non-gender biased. Because it is gender biased. It's as simple as that. There is. is a personality set and type that is effective in science and it's male. And, you know, you know, we shouldn't, you know, it's good to identify it. It's not good to paint everyone as being bad because some of us are good and some of us are bad. Yeah. Some female scientists are bad and some female scientists are good. We need to be a little bit smarter in how we think and talk about things because it's not as simple as people think. But it the numbers not. are obvious. The numbers are frighteningly obvious. Women drop out of science. And it's down to kids. It really is down to kids, largely. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I, th I think we could... We could uh record another podcast episode totally about, <laughs> about this question oh but you have to talk to a female scientist you really do because like they their, their opinion is is i mean you know i have my opinion on my side but yeah. female scientists need a you know lot what, more voice what we should be doing is actually doing a panel discussion yeah. where we would gather different scientists from different parts of the world uh various ages female and male scientists and and try and talk about this and try and find solutions onto what 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 are the actionable items that we can take yeah. on in the next t five ten years in order to change this but you can see it's it, i mean it's i mean it's not a problem in medicine it's not a problem in veterinary science it's definitely not a problem in dentistry the, the, the i mean those feel i mean there are problems higher up but not in recruitment and intention i think science is the the drop-off is much faster I don't know. I know that there is a drop off after after a PhD, and there is an yeah. even higher drop off after a postdoc. Yeah. Uh, but it's uh, it's. <laughs> I think it's it's uh, it's it's interesting. It's like type two diabetes. It's a multifactorial <laughs> <laughs> disease, yeah. but uh, there is a lot of things that that are at play there, and it's not it's not one thing. I think it's multiple things. Yeah. That oh, need yeah. to change. Need to be Absolutely. modulated. But I think you know identifying. And I think getting yeah. getting the opinion, I mean, is the, the most important thing. It's like we said about diseases before. Understand what the problem is. What actually is the problem? Yeah. What is the problem? Sure, the result is an issue, but where does that result come from? Why are there so few or why are there so many issues of career progression or promotion or uh, identification? Yeah. Is it? Is it choice? Is it nurture? Is it environment? Is it options? I think. I, don't know. I think sometimes yeah. it's it's also cultural in the sense as as culture not that varies from country to country. I think it's just the planet that's like this because because of of as you had mentioned, women are tend to be more agreeable mm -hmm. than men. Uh, women tend to be more. Um, they think more about the next step. 
men sometimes have this tendency of saying, you know what, I'm just going to say something and whatever happens, happens. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's by experience. But I, for example, yeah. I'm, I've had instances and I've heard stories of, of women having to, having being questioned about their ability to do a certain job. And it really felt like it's because they're women or they may not be speaking as confidently as a man would. And I think it's, it's just, it's a problem. It is mm -hmm. a problem. And you're being, whenever, for example, you're looking for a job in industry as a PhD or as a, having a postdoc, the tendency that I've noticed that I've talked about with, with many of my friends is that, especially if you're a woman, you, it's hard for you to go to an, in a position that is above a senior scientist, for example. So if you were to go for a principal scientist job in industry, or you were to go for an associate director job in industry as well, being a woman, most of the time makes it more difficult to be considered into those roles. And I've had experiences where I was with people on the phone during interviews, and I could tell that it was an uphill battle because I was already starting the conversation in that box. Wow. And me getting out of that box was was a no-go with that particular person then again i had other interviews with other people where it was very easy to show off the skills show off that you can do more than what they thought you were able to do so i think similarly to the situation in academia in science in general there are these there are different people who have different mm -hmm. um ways of looking at things and we just have to kind of decrease the concentration of those who think that there is just a box that women can fit in yeah. And there's that line. So what do you think of the, the sort of Queen Bee syndrome, the sort of this, this concept? Because I think there was a recent sort of a contentious research article put out about female bosses uh, being a discouraging factor for women. It was very, very, very contentious. I think it, it eventually got pulled, I think, from the journal, I think. Interesting. But there, yeah, yeah, but there, there, there was this, this concept that women don't pref don't like working for female bosses because uh, there's sort of like there's this uniqueness capacity of being the female scientist and that any competition for their unique position was often seen as a bad thing i don't know if you've ever seen I, or heard of that it's, it's i can't a, remember the exact paper but it was it was specifically about that i haven't seen that paper i think there right. is also there, there there are two two levels of difficulties in my mind is uh, being able to move up to that, you know, professorship or that director level as a woman because, because of the abundance of your male colleagues. But there is also mm -hmm. the fact that those sometimes, and this is not in any way a generalization, not everyone is like this, but they have, I've heard of situations where women have had it so hard in order to get to the position they were at that it's it's like being a mentor for too long and forgetting that you actually studied out pipetting as well and forgetting where yeah. you came from mm -hmm. and then not being able to put yourself in other people's shoes or maybe thinking to yourself and I, I don't think it's gender specific but telling yourself you know what i've had it hard good luck i'm gonna give it to you hard and if you survive good for you and if you don't too bad yeah and i i i, I don't think it's a it's a gender thing no i maybe. think i think I think there's something in that. I think there's too much of a, uh, a culture of attrition in science. It's sort of like, oh, if you can't cut it, then just leave. And that's it. Rather than, oh, you're actually talented and you're really good, but there are these, there are these forces that are making you want to leave. Let's just fix those problems rather than saying, oh, if you can't hack it, leave. And it's like, dude, that's really dumb exactly. and really one dimensional. I think that that is what has happened for too long. And it's, it's a real macho sort of view of like, Oh, you can't hack it. Then, you know, then just then, deal with it rather than, well, why can't you hack it? If a talented person doesn't want to work there, why they often say, Oh, yeah. well, cause you're not good enough or blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, 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 no. It's because of the culture. And it's sort of, I think that attrition concept, and it's sort of like an elitist sort of thing in a way yeah. that only only we can do science and only we can be exceptional and blah, blah, blah. And I don't like that in a way because I would often, you know, sort of, you know, tell people that, you know, you can be, you know, I would often find that somebody that, say, wasn't intellectually talented but harder working was often way better to have than somebody who was very smart but 
thought they could just dial it in all the time. And it's like, it doesn't, you know, that, that actually team work and doing something and helping, I prize over talent and genius and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I can tolerate. I mean, there's a certain amount of geniusness that you can tolerate, but it very quickly wears off if it's not conducive to yeah. the group is always more important than the individual. I just don't, even if, even if that individual is transcendent and beyond belief, I think my ethos is it's team is everything. It's everything. It's, it's more than just science. It's society. And I don't want to sacrifice yeah. lots of people just because somebody is intolerant or somebody is, is badly genius, behaved. But it's, it's not yeah. worth it. It's not worth it. Cause then it just devalues everyone else. Yep. And, and that again, that, I think it's a topic that we could, we could start on talking about in, a, in another podcast episode, <laughs> because I think that's the, that's the other thing is that building a team, building a company or building an ecosystem yeah. requires people who are willing to work towards making that team, that ecosystem viable uh, that develops and moves forward. Mm -hmm. And those outliers, they may not be in the right place or they may not know how to interact with the team. Yeah. And then sometimes you have to make those difficult decisions where you say, well, you know, this person is a genius, but they don't work well with anyone. Yeah. And then weigh out what's the benefit and the, uh, you yeah. know, having them. The, the other problem on that issue as well is that too often, let's say someone is exceptionally talented, then they're almost left to languish in their bad social skill space, which is not good for them either. Because I'm sorry, you still need to be in this world. It doesn't work if you are just so spiky and so crazy. And that's not that you're not learning either. That that exactly. person, just because they're a genius, doesn't mean that they can't learn because there are other skills. You know, there are, oddly enough, there are more skills than just being a smart person because just being a smart person, I, I, I mean, you know, I, all my peers at school, I was by far not the smartest kid at school, but other smarter kids have, might not have been successful as me because they were academically very smart, but they might not have been yeah. as rounded a person. And this is part of the issue of lack of diversity in science is that there is a criminal ignorance of so-called soft skills, a criminal ignorance of it that really is just not very smart i mean it's it yep. doesn't you know i specifically try and hire people i tell people i don't want to hire me i don't want a bunch of me's in the lab because there's no point because i'm here already there's no point in having me i would rather have different types of people because yep. machines are not made out of identical components it doesn't work yeah and it's also boring <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I'm it sorry is. to come back to having fun in lab. You have to have diversity of people in exactly. every way, in every essence, in, in, in culture, in age, in experience, in yeah. mood, in temperament. Yep. I, I always look for something that's there, i.e. passion. That's always that's the, most, the most important thing. I will take somebody that has very little experience or very little knowledge if they really want to do it. Sure, they have to be in a position where they can do it. I'm not going to take somebody that has completely inability to do the job, but passion is everything because skills can be learned. Techniques can be honed. Passion yes. is, is something which is a drive and all the skills in the world without passion mean nothing. And okay. it's sort of, I'm, as you get older, you learn how to temper your passion. But when I was young, very, very, very passionate about science and passionate about how it should be done. And I still am, but, um, but yeah, I think it's sort of, yeah, there's too much repetition of the same person in science in many, many, many different ways. And it's just not smart. It's not smart at all. Yeah. And I think it's because of this attrition concept that, you know, that if somebody is not perfect at something all the time, then they need to be, uh, released and Would jettisoned and that's it. And I think exactly. that's so stupid. That's so stupid because it's sort of, you know, there aren't that many 
examples of somebody that's that crucial. It's like, you know, my perfect example is like uh, French national football team. When Zidane wasn't playing, worst in the world. Was Zidane there? <laughs> the best in the world. And it's like, that—that that, that is not the, the standard case. No one is exactly. exceptional beyond belief. Exactly. So having consensual interest and breadth of experience and knowledge and skills, you know, irrespective, I mean, the science is going to get done. Do you want to do it with fun? Or do you want to do it with, uh, you know, <laughs> I often... <laughs> I often tell students, you know, there's like carrots or stick. And it's like, I want you to work hard. I want you to want to work. I yeah. don't want to beat you over the head. That's no. the only constant that's required. And it doesn't, it's, it's not the sole premise of any one type of person. Of course not. And of course not. I would say the biggest thing that is an issue, and I've seen this many times in many cases in say sort of lab meetings and stuff. And I had, many examples of this, is often uh, it's a confidence thing that women know the answer or female scientists know the answer, but they just, for some reason, the lack of confidence or the lack of, I don't know, it's, it's, there's something which is, I, I think it's not lack of confidence. I think it's just the, the overt male killer instinct drive. Again, I think it, it goes back to the fact that maybe two people, a male and a female scientist, both know the answer. The woman thinks about it in many different ways, kind of like a computer going through, okay, mm -hmm. if this is that, then this is, this is the answer. And then the male yeah. is like, oh, maybe this is it. So I'm going to just blurb it up. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we are totally, you know, we do not mind. I mean, it's, it's like I say, you know, you know, you can either, you know, keep your mouth shut and let people think you're stupid, or you can open your mouth and prove that you're stupid. Men are not afraid of proving that they're stupid at times. Not at all. And the, prob and the problem there in life, sure, men will do that. Full stop. Full stop, full stop, full stop. But a mentor will then wait and potentially ask the female member of staff, well, what do you think? That's what should be done. Not just go with the first answer that comes out from the kid that wants to improve, wants to sort of like, you know, show off as much as possible. Yeah. Exactly. That's where joined up thinking comes in. It's like, oh, well, I will ask everyone. Whereas I've seen, I have seen it many times that that answer just goes with and that's it because it's quick and da da da. And, da, da. Yeah, and that's exactly. what business is like. It's yeah. strong decision making and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. That's the culture. Unfortunately, it is. Problem. And I think it's the mentor's obligation as well is to make sure that everyone feels comfortable in a meeting setting or any time to be able to blurb out something and say, well, I'm not sure I didn't get a chance to think about it completely, which is, I think, totally something that I would say, but make sure that everyone is comfortable blurbing out something yeah. and then and having that team go at it and say, well, yes and no, and this is why, yeah. and having that discussion, having that interaction without feeling that you're being attacked or if you say something, everyone will say, well, no. You don't yeah. know what you're talking about. Yeah, I think I, I think a lot of this also still stems from that, you know, because I've I've been in big labs and stuff like that, and it's like you know the 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 pressure to be first and to get that paper and to get, that's that's yes. overwhelming because that is the model of success, full stop. Yeah. And <laughs> the problem that does lie with the mentor, but it also lies with publishing houses and blah yes. blah blah. Yeah. It, it, that we need that, that that is not a productive way it might be it's a productive way for one or two people but not for everyone else it's and it's not, like it's not but it's, it's difficult because you still need a way to i don't know quantify success yeah mm -hmm. um award funding and yeah. you know there is there is there is a system that needs to be there but then again that this system that we have currently is not the best of systems yeah I think the problem is, is, is that mentor separation, is that supervisor separation, is that too often, and it's like this is the case with lots of, you know, funding bodies and stuff, is that the, the quality, you know, people reading papers is a bit of a quaint thing. The, the, the title and the impact factor is everything. The actual content it might not actually be looked at that much. And it's the same with also management as well is that a manager needs to communicate and talk with every single person, potentially in an individual setting and not in a group setting, because there are some good group people and there are some bad group people. 
and you can you know somebody's worth if you talk to them and you understand what they're doing and what they are doing and not what yeah. someone else is doing exactly. and that's people have become it's it's real easy it's like a, it's like for grant selection or for student selection is that often or for just grading people is how quickly can i fail you how quickly can i put an x and get rid of you rather than i'll listen to everything that you say and then i'll see how far up the grade scale you get how quickly can i eject you from the pile oh you yeah. did that wrong boom that's it and it's like yeah exactly that's a very old fashioned biased view it of is. success it's saying that that you, your worth is based on the number of fails you have rather than the number of positives you have exactly and it's just dumb because everyone fails it just depends if you see that fail first or last because the the sort of the the hot shot kid who might be rising to the top they'll fail at some point they won't always succeed and the person that wasn't potentially the hot shot at the start will probably succeed at the end if they were if they were not succeeding as much at the start and i never use the word fail i never i don't like it at all and i never try to be harsh on students oh it's just degrees of success and it's not just great inflation blah 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 because yeah. as a teacher you shouldn't have fails you should if somebody is having a serious problem and cannot do it then you have to sit them down and say dude it's not for you okay but if yeah. you do take somebody on board and you do uh, sort of say that I'm your mentor and stuff you make damn sure that they do that they reach their highest level that they can and that's it Great. every person you do that with and it's you know a manager is a, is you know it's it's a mixture of team manager and man manager or person manager I shouldn't say man manager <laughs> uh but it's it's it, and and that's one thing that a lot of good supervisors do and it's like the whole bill clinton thing is that you know while they're talking to you you feel as though you're the only person in the world and you go and do that for every person and you go and make sure that you understand that each person then understands that you have their attention i, I think that is a real thing that is missing in a way group meetings are often bad because they end up being dominated by the same person saying the same thing each time yep and it's sort of it's it's a bit old i mean it's a problem that <laughs> You know, that, it, it needs some work, I think. I think at the end of the day, there are a lot of things that need to be reviewed on what's working, what isn't working. And um, a lot of everyone needs to be open-minded to test new things yep. and to see what are those solutions, potential solutions that work mm -hmm. for that team, for that group or for that individual. Because you can see how this ethos actually comes a little bit from the science in itself. That if you're like a uh, sort of like a linear scientist that just keeps doing the same thing, that's your mode of life. Therefore, your mode of life is not yeah. accepting of other things or changing or diversity or improvement or modernization. Yes. Whereas if you're always thinking about what's different or what you can do or how you can change or how you can improve, that's it. That's the cultures in that way merge slightly. That that the process of doing science actually ends up being the process of doing management. And if all you're doing is the same experiment over and over again, all you can do is manage in the same way over and over again. <laughs> Great. And if the person you've learned from did that, then you do that. And in some ways, it's often championed that, that, that a person might be considered to be a world expert on something that no one else knows about that isn't particularly important, but they're the world expert on it, so they need to get the grant. And it's like, yeah, yeah. but it's not worth it. <laughs> exactly. And, exactly. And it's, it's, there is... There's always value. There's always a value judgment to be made. And too often in science, it's sort of, you know, it's sure, you know, somebody might be dedicated and might be the smartest person in the world on that thing, but is it worth it? There's, you know, also, I mean, that's the one thing I always tell people, never forget the vast, vast, vast majority of science is publicly funded. It's not free money. And it's, somebody is paid for that and they yes. want you know they're, they there want is, a return on their investment yeah. and they expect you, it absolutely and they they deserve it because i mean you know if you're in a lab and you're i'm paying for it we're all paying taxes so why would you waste your own money it's so stupid but exactly. especially if you're given the responsibility and and you are you know you're talking to people that are suffering from diseases and you're using that money and you're not doing your best job with it that's 
that's shocking. Yeah, maybe you and should find something else to do. At that yeah. point. It's it's that point. And, but that that's where government and institutions um, really need to. I think it's it's the way of keeping. I mean, to a lot of scientists, they will end up just going down a rabbit hole and doing their own thing, and that's it. But they need to be. I feel very strongly about that. We had this at the MRC once, and there was a there was like a sea change in the the science that was done. They, it was all, it was saying, okay, all this pituitary stuff, and we ain't doing it anymore. It's prostate cancer and uterine fibroids, because that's a problem in society. You guys are scientists. You can work it out. Some scientists were not happy with it. I was perfectly fine. So, yeah, sure. I, I, you know, I work in a pragmatic system, and that's no problem. And I do believe that, you know, John Q taxpayers paying for this, John Q taxpayers should be getting something from it. Yes. And virtually, I mean, you know, Virtually every single penny of funding comes that way. There might be one or two private foundations, but that's very rare. The vast majority is public money. It is. And for that to be used in such archaic systems that are not controlled or regulated or moderated or advanced in some way is a bad system. And I think it's, it's sort of, I think it's a problem. You can't ask people to police themselves because you know no. the system will just keep the system and that's it and i've tried to yeah. i've always tried to fight it i've always tried to you know do the right thing and it's often very difficult um, it is because you're fighting against the the norm or the, the thing that has been developed as the norm it's the current it's like um yeah. you know it's it's hard it's hard it's going against against the wind or it's you know trying to yeah. walk into the ocean mm -hmm. when you have waves coming at you I'd say that, that is definitely, when you sit down and think about it, that is one of the most important things. The, the technical advancements and the intellectual advancements in science are not a problem. The culture of science, I think, is, is, has lagged behind slightly. I, you know, I've, but, you know, I've been in it since like, being a student at like, the age of you know, 18, and I would say it's not that much different. I think the, cu the culture is still what it is. I don't think it's changed that much. Which is unfortunate when you think about it. Yeah, unfortunately, considering how much the technology has moved on in that yes, time, exactly. It's like yeah, we're not thinking smarter. We're we're not exploiting talent. We're not growing. And this is what I, I hate this concept of like failing people. Or it's like no, 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 no. If if you're a teacher in a class, or or if you have a good group of students, you your goal should be everyone to be passing and everyone to succeeding. And if they are in a position where they are going to fail then a mistake has been made in putting them on that course to begin with. Exactly. Maybe that's it, not their not their destiny. That's not something they're good at and they should reconsider. Yeah. And it's and hard it's, to be told, hey, this is not for you. Yeah. But then again, you better learn that really quickly and then pivot. Yeah. yeah. And instead that of been... trying to hammer at it for years and actually end up a mediocre scientist yeah. with, who's not happy because yeah. you haven't found what you're looking for and for, forget about you know wasting taxpayers money forget about mm -hmm. doing science that's irrelevant just think about you as a person if you're not yeah. where you're supposed to be you're not using the talent that you are given yeah. then you just wasted your life basically i think i think touching on that is an important issue because i would say that you know there has been a a, a massive increase in postgraduate research and science. And I yeah. think a lot of people, it is a difficult transition for them because either they go into it without any expectation of carrying on, and therefore it's difficult from a point of view of real dedication to their job, but also the feeling that they might not have succeeded if they don't go and do the traditional route. And that's a problem because the majority yeah. of their managers that they'll come across have only succeeded in the traditional route and not done other types of things or seeing that is it that is a yeah. part of training for other things and this is an issue with the training process where people don't understand or recognize <laughs> or train in other skills other yes. than just writing papers because writing papers only really exists in one world and that's it and that's science everything else no one would write these ridiculous <laughs> long-winded over-the-top detailed things they would yeah. write like two pages and that's it and you better be quick and to the point yeah it's that's it's true. a very it's esoteric in the extreme and yet, that's all that gets trained, to a large extent. Yeah, it's 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 it, it, it it's a odd. It's like a job system that says, "We'll take you on, 
but if you're not one of us, forget it. And it's like, dude. Exactly. It's Again, so- it goes back into fitting into that, that box that has been defined and not having, yeah. I think you mentioned that uh, you had these 3D printed yeah. um, shapes that were mimicking uh-huh. systems. And I think yeah. that's, that's how science should be perceived. It's, it's yeah. a collection and I'm going to go back to GPCRs. It's a collection yep. of, of active states of different mm-hmm. states. Yeah. And that the, the whole, the, the, the collection or the entirety makes it, makes science beautiful and, and allows mm-hmm. people to, to advance science and ask different questions than, you know, people 30, 50 years ago. And gives you flexibility. I mean, this is the problem with if everyone is taught and thinks in the same way, when things change, which of things? always change yeah the responsivity is going to be bad but if you have a plurality of views opinions trainings and, and this is the other thing as well is that you know that background is is very different i mean especially you know that a lot of academia is populated by people from a set number of universities and that's it and it's like dude it's like there are other smart people out there you know it's really it's uh, that's uh, an issue uh i think it's difficult to do it when there's the concept of uh, perfection and apex rather than group. And that's, that is an issue because then that forces attrition because it's sure if there's one person at the top, then not everyone's going to get there. So, and, but it's such an inefficient yeah. process because people go further and further and further, but if they don't reach the top, then they'll spend all that time becoming more and more and more isolated and esoteric. And then when they don't get that top position, what are they good for? Yes, it's the end of it's, the world. <laughs> yeah, it's bad it's time world. management. Yeah, yeah, it's bad time. But then all the money and time and effort that's gone into getting them there is squandered mm. to it a is. certain extent. Yeah, and it's taxpayers' and it, money as well. Yeah, it's it's not effective. And it's sort of, yeah, it, it comes back to why I do pharmacology. Is It's a science of effect. It's only there to produce effect. It's not there to exist in itself. It, it, it would be meaningless without having an effect. So it's and, sort of... It's and it f- stays beautiful. I think it's just yeah. beautiful. I often... It's funny. I live in, a, you know, in Belgium now, and uh, I often explain things about English language and stuff. It's always funny. And as a joke, I often say in England, when you say you know, something is academic it means it serves no effective purpose. <laughs> you know, oh, it's an academic football result. It doesn't matter. Or oh, that's just an academic. And it's like, yeah, it's sad that, you know, that that actually phraseology is there. Unfortunately, it's proved right quite often, unfortunately, that it is academic what people do. And it's like, dude, it should not be like that. It should never <laughs> be like that. And the word academic should not be associated to not important or... yeah. But it's sort of, it's sort of, it, wow. it's an institution that really hasn't changed. And it really hasn't changed. I mean, and I think it of, takes a lot of people who actually can admit to the fact that it needs change and actually do something about it. And yeah. That's, it's, that's it's, not easy. It's very difficult. It's very difficult. I think the, there are so many organizations that converge to maintain the structure of academia um it's um yeah it's it's a very tricky thing it is it is i'm looking at the clock and i think we <laughs> have gotten to a po- i think this is this is a, a milestone i've never rec- we've never recorded such a long podcast ever oh my goodness <laughs> oh my goodness i uh, i'm sure the next person will blow it away i'm sure but uh it's it's well i think the important i think the nice thing is is and I think this, you know, sci- you know, it's like this work-life balance. Science is super important. What we do is super important. And we absolutely fully know that. But you know what? We're still people. And yeah. that personality, if you, if you cut out and you ignore that personality part of science, then it gets odd. And it m- might end up being an academic uh, venture. And it might do bad things. And it might not do the right research. The humanity is everything to maintain us on a good course. And the further we get away from that, I think the, it does end up going bad, doing bad things. So it's, that's, what I, that's what I like about this in the fact that it's, um, you know, 
it should be broad ranging and we should be placing it in every sort of aspect of life and every sort of part of yeah. culture. Being scientifically literate should be the same as being appreciative of high art. It's just a different thing. And we are incredibly esoteric. I mean, the things that we, it's a, fa it's a, it's a, it's a standard thing that you always tell people to practice the talk with their relative that doesn't know anything about it and stuff. Yeah. And it's like, you know, that, that when you have been in science for a long time, you, you could spend like 10 days telling people exactly what you know. And it's like, it would just wash over people's heads. And like, what's the point? You know, you're smart and you know, lots and lots and lots of things, but they're a person just like you, okay? You're not that much better. You're not that much smarter. And they might, you know, your HVAC engineer could come around and make far more money than you do. And yep. he could be just a good person as you are, or she could yeah. be. So, yeah. yeah. Or, uh, I think, or, or that person could could um, know more than you know about other things. Absolutely. Because they have, you know, this ability to, to read, they, they have this desire to read books about things that you've never shown interest in. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I don't think someone or anyone should be judged by their position or the fact that they're scientists or not. I think that we're all human. At the end of the day, we all have good sides, bad sides, good days, bad days. Always. And uh, <laughs> I think, <laughs> and I think that's that's what makes us colorful, and that's what makes the spectrum of of you know of people mm -hmm. so so beautiful. At the end of the I day, I think that's a wonderful. I think that's a wonderful place to. Uh, Let you get back to your all day, because, dude, it is quarter to midnight here. I it know, I know. My, the police have probably been called by my wife. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and I wasn't saying, you know, I wasn't talking about the time, but just to, just to say that I really enjoy the conversation. I didn't It's even notice that the uh, that the time went on for so long. We've definitely uh, gotten to. Uh, a rec record long podcast episode, but I would definitely love to pick up the conversation uh, where we're leaving it off right now. Okay. It's been a great pleasure. And uh, go home before, you before your wife actually calls me and tells me. Uh, I'm, sh I'm sure <laughs> she's gone to bed now already, hopefully. So uh, I'm sure I'll, I'll have to be quiet when I get in. So that, that'll be okay. But, uh, <laughs> it's been a pleasure. And I hope, Uh, even though it's very long, I hope people can have a listen to it. And, you know, you can fast forward over the boring bits, honestly. And just if you get something out of it, if you just get one little thing, if you just get one bit of positivity, one bit of good advice, dude, that's it. It's like uh, all I can do is try and help. So and I think hopefully it's been a conduit for that. I hope so. It's been a great pleasure. And I think people will love uh, listening to the podcast. And I think the fact that, yes, you can hit pause or you can fast forward. <laughs> Is it is why long format podcasts, long format talks, are the place to talk at length yeah. of about topics because you, the person listening to it is in control of what they want to listen to and how long they they're willing to listen us talking. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you, Stuart. It's been Bye a now. pleasure. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for this Dr. GPCR podcast episode. I'd like to thank our guest, as well as our team members, Attila Forrest, Shivani Sajdev, Alexa Juran, and Ines Pinero. Please subscribe to the Dr. GPCR newsletter, find us on YouTube, and if you like our podcast, leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcast. You can also leave us a testimonial at drgpcr.com slash testimonials. Another way to support us is to share your favorite Dr. GPCR program with your network and colleagues. Email us with any questions or suggestions at hello at drgpcr.com. Until next time, stay safe. Mm -hmm.